the day, everyone. <laughs> this is Anisha Kalita, General Secretary, Finance and Investments at Aryabhat College. On behalf of the entire society, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who are here with us on day two of the annual finance conclave phenomena, deliberating ideas, directing minds. For all those who were not here with us yesterday, I would like to elaborate a bit on what this event stands for. The event aims to initiate discussions and deliberations with the industry's most adept personalities to steer young minds into the right direction. It serves as a forum for students to interact with pioneers from diversified fields such as finance, business, politics, journalism, entertainment, etc. We aim to bring together an international community of leaders of today and leaders from tomorrow. This event will help the students to enhance their knowledge while giving them the golden opportunity to see the world from the eyes of these distinguished personalities. Before moving on, I would like to introduce my co-host Khushbu Bansal. Thank you, Anisha, for inviting me. Hello, everyone. My name is Kushbu Bansal, and now I would like to invite Karsh Vashisht, who is the Vice President of Finance and Investment Cell, Arifat College, to share his thoughts about the conclave. Thank you very much, Kushbu. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, greetings for the day. As we gather here for the concluding day of Phenomena, the Finance Conclave, I, Karsh Vashisht, Vice President of Finance and Investment Cell, Arifat College, welcome you all from the very bottom of my heart finance investment cell is not just a society but a family a family of 60 plus finance and economics enthusiasts who have come together to build a community of like-minded people who constantly strive to nurture their skill sets knowledge and personality as a whole a student body which was set up in 2017 has today grown to become one of the best finance cell in the University of Delhi circuit and we are proud of our team. As the tagline of our event suggests, we aim to discuss and deliberate with the industry's most adept personalities and provide direction to young minds who are the future of this beautiful country, India. I would like to thank everyone here today for being a part of this prestigious event. As the Vice President, it is a tremendous honor to see so many dignified and other personalities from different sectors and to have a massive number of audience from different parts of India. I also extend my acknowledgement to our respected Principal Sir, Professor Manoj Chena, respected Coordinator Dr. J.K. Singh, our Convener, Ms. Pratika Dua and Ms. Priya Chaudhary. Once again, I welcome each one of you to this finance conclave and to its concluding day. Thank you. Now, we will be going live in just a minute. Till then, stay tuned.
everyone. So let's start the evening for today. We, we have with us right now Mr. Arvind Mayaram. Mr. Arvind Mayaram has worked as the Finance Secretary of India and is currently working as the Chief Economic Advisor of the Government of Rajasthan. His journey and the experience that he has gained while traveling the length and breadth of the country has truly inspired all of us. We are really glad that you have uh, joined us today. I would also like to invite Karsh Vashisht and Sarthak, who are the interviewers for today. But before we could start the conversation with Sir, I would like to invite Professor Sanket Shekhar uh, uh, to share a few words and invite uh, the Honorable Speaker. Am I audible? Yes, you are. There are some technical glitches from Sanket sir's side, Kushbu. So I think uh, whenever sir uh, arrives, then we can have the speech from sir. Right now, we should begin because he just left the meeting. Sure, sure. Please continue. So thank you so much for joining us today and giving your precious time from a busy schedule. So let's start with a very basic question. So how are you and how has your pandemic been for you? Am I audible now? Yes, sir, yeah. you are audible. Oh. Oh, okay. So Sharad sir has joined. So I guess uh, Sanket sir has joined. So I guess uh, uh, you can start, sir. Uh, sir, uh, first of all, very welcome from the state of colorful state to uh, state of heart, Delhi, from Rajasthan to Delhi. Uh, we are very fortunate to have you here, sir. I was going through your profile before joining this meeting. So I came to know about your um, astonishing work you have done and you have added uh, values to the millions' life. And we believe that the college is very fortunate to have you today. And especially in the times of COVID-19, where students, especially undergraduate students, were very concerned about the economy, how the economy is going to prosper, how their career are going to be placed in the coming future. So on behalf of college authority, all my colleagues from various departments, all uh, administrative staff, principal, and from Delhi University, I welcome uh, Sir to this platform. And I am confident that the students and all the all the people, all the participants who have joined at various platforms will have a very enriching session. So, uh, sir, once again, I welcome to this Aryabhat College. Had it been the offline mode, so I think that the color uh, that you put in from Rajasthan would have been more vibrant. So, once again, I welcome you, sir, on this platform. Thank you very much. I am really happy to be here with uh, all of you, especially the students. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, sir, my question was, how are you, sir? And how has the pandemic been for you? Well, I've been well, thank you. Uh, uh, God has been kind. So, till now, touch wood, I have escaped COVID. But pandemic like it has been for most people in the country hasn't been very good for any one of us because one, uh, it's difficult to get locked down. And the other, of course, it has wreaked havoc with the economy, which is very worrisome. We, uh, we are going to face a little difficult time going forward for a few years because of the, uh, with a, with the manner in which economy has been. Amazing, sir. But, sir, from where are you joining us right now? Are you in Rajasthan or from or in Delhi? I'm in Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. I'm very much in Rajasthan, yes. Okay, sir. So, let's start, sir, with the interview process. So, sir, currently, as I can see, more than 200 students are watching us live from various parts of this country. And, sir, many of us have a dream of becoming an IS officer. But only a handful have achieved this glorious victory. So, sir, walk us through your journey, becoming an IS officer, then the finance secretary of India, and then the economic advisor to Rajasthan government. Big, well, Indian administrative service is uh, truly uh, a remarkable and unique service in a manner of speaking, because I don't think anywhere in the world you have a service of this kind which gives the, uh, the members of the service the kind of varied experience uh, in almost every field of life uh, in terms of administration, in terms of policy making, uh, which, has an, which impacts a very large number of people. 
so I think I've been very fortunate and uh, I am uh, humbled also that I was able to uh, go through my journey in the service in a manner that um, I, w I don't have to look back with regret about anything. But uh, one thing is certain that I think motivation of joining the service has to be very clear why we want to join the service because ultimately IAS is not the only service or is not the only vocation in the country and now increasingly the opportunity for young people like you are immense in different fields so uh, anyone who wishes to join the IAS must actually first introspect and ask herself or himself why uh, is it that the service would it still fascinates you? And it, that, I think, is very important. I must tell you that what is a bit disappointing for me is because a lot of young people now get into the service because they believe it gives you a lot of power and authority. It gives you... But uh, they don't realize that power and authority is basically a kind... It's, it's like a car or it's like a vehicle where you can sit in it and if you are a good driver, it will take you to your destination in quickly. If you are a very bad driver, then it, you might crash on the road. So uh, authority or power must be seen as a means towards an end, not an end in itself. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of young people nowadays believe it's an end in itself. So uh, my, I would urge all of you who wish to get into IAS, I would wish you success. Uh, the service do, uh, does need bright, young, idealistic people. But please go into the service with the right motivation and knowing fully well that it is not a bed of roses, that it has a lot of difficulties, uh, that you have to uh, go through a grind. It requires a lot of hard work and uh, dedication. And it's not an easy life in that sense. Sir, it was a really insightful answer, and I must say all our viewers must got inspired from you. So you have also shown that you have a keen interest in finance, and you have also been finance secretary of India, and also you have done PhD in finance. So, so please tell us about your passion in the subject. So ultimately, if you look at it, I think it, it comes from the fact that when I was growing up or when I was going through uh, college and uh, university, at that point of time, uh, we were all very impacted by uh, the left ideology. If you remember, India was a country of a lot of poor people, uh, deprived people, we, a lot of backwardness. And therefore, we were all uh, fired by the left ideology. I would not say communist ideology, because that's more in terms of a party line. But uh, we... I mean, uh, my generation of young people were all fired by the Marxian thought of uh, how the uh, poor uh, are, uh, you know, kind of uh, exploited and how they suffer and how they need to be empowered. So uh, the underlying basis for all that is uh, is uh, eco economy or economics. You know, basically, it is the um, the foundation of any left ideology, or for that matter, any ideology, is economy. Ultimately, we are looking at for the well-being of the people, and we want them to be out of poverty, and we want them to have a good life. So you need to understand that economy is, is what drives uh, the pursuit of uh, happiness, of pursuit of, of being well-being. So uh, although my formal education till, uh, till uh, master's was in political science, which also gave me an insight into how political economies work, uh, I, over a period of time, branched into the field of uh, uh, e economy and finance. And uh, that's how I uh, also then pursued a PhD in, uh, in uh, finance and uh, ended up being the finance secretary of the country. Amazing, sir. Amazing. Sir, we can see your dedication towards finance by your answer. And all the viewers must have got inspired by your journey and your career path. But, sir, we are very unaware of difficulties and discomfort that lies behind the scenes. 
in life of an administrator can you please shed some light on this especially how do bureaucrats have have to handle the political pressure mixed with the public expectations so uh, i would like to say something here i think for a very long period of time we bel- have believed that the politicians are the villains of the peace and very large number of uh, bureaucrats including police officers have come out like uh, knights in shining, shining armor and tilting at the political windmill and trying to say that they will save the country from the politician i think nothing can be farther uh, than uh, uh, from truth than this uh, i think we have to understand that foundationally if we want to be a democracy which we must always uh, accept and uh, be committed to as a, as the founding principle of our country and democracy means that every person must have a right every person must have freedom of speech then we have to understand that a country as diverse as ours i mean your college would also have a lot of students from different parts of the country so you have somebody come from coming from bihar somebody from jharkhand someone may be from assam somebody is from tamil nadu or from andhra pradesh we are a very diverse country and in this time, the development also is asymmetrical some areas are more developed some areas are less developed and so you have a symmetry of uh, and so to be able to uh, develop a consensus is a very difficult thing as we are seeing in the case of the farmers agitation which has been going on for two months the problem is not in terms of whether agriculture sector should have reforms or not but the problem is whether we have done our homework to create a consensus now consensus building in a country like ours is a very difficult and long process and sometimes we walk two steps forward and then one step backwards this is how in a large country like ours which has a very diverse population and diverse uh, eco- uh, you know economic classes we need to create a, a overarching consensus now when we become too much in a hurry as many of us do sitting in uh, in you know kind of when we are a little more prosperous when uh, we have achieved or our parents have achieved a certain level of prosperity then we be- begin to get impatient with the pace of change all young people become impatient pace of change we believe that we need a very strong person who will come and change everything and he the person will be you know will brook no nonsense from anybody it's a classic syndrome of having a strong man syndrome as we call it which we believe is going to be the panacea in our neighboring countries it has been a military dictatorships you have seen in pakistan or even bangladesh yes military dictatorships have i mean military has taken over because people thought a strong military government is going to change everything we have seen it actually has created more mess so democracy is messy it takes longer period of time but the politicians are like if you if i may give the example of a pressure cooker you see on a pressure on top of a pressure cooker you have that uh, that weight which keeps bobbing up and down and releases the gas the politicians are like that because of the frustrations in the people because their crisis of expectation because of slow pace of change different uh, you know kind of pulls and pressures politicians have a, this immense capacity to uh, to be able to pull all these together to create a consensus most politicians do when politicians begin to fail in creating consensus you start getting agitation you start having people demonstrating on the streets because consensus is break is has broken down so i don't think there is any kind of a conflict between the bureaucrats and the politicians bureaucrats are the ones i always have held there are few bureaucrats who are harbingers of change who push change but most politi- uh, bureaucrats are designed to as a person people who consolidate and maintain the real change comes from politicians they change because the, there is so pressure on them every five years they go and fight elections and therefore they have to be responsive to the needs of the people bureaucrats are not that responsive to the needs of the people so i would say 
at the macro level, the bureaucrats do very well because we are able to bring a lot of ex global experience from our own readings and from our own experiences. We put it together as a, as a macro principle. By the micro level, you you need the politician to be able to put the nuts and bolts together, the economy, country to keep going. When politicians begin to, fail, then you they, you find that country begins to get into trouble, and uh, I think and I think therefore, in my journey, as you ask me, difficulties with politicians. It's not as if everybody is the same. I think you. You find corrupt bureaucrats, you find corrupt politicians, you find unreasonable bureaucrats, you find unreasonable bureaucrats, I mean, politicians, and, you, and businessmen. I mean, we come from the same stock. After all, you and I are not from two different planets. Just because I'm an IS officer doesn't make me any different from you. I mean, we come from the same kind of uh, milieu. And so then we reflect that in our day-to-day -day behavior. But on the whole, my experience with politicians have been very good. I think uh, they have uh, given uh, the country a stable uh, sy political system. If you look at after the Second World War, if you look at all the countries which came out of colonial rule, uh, countries which were, were earlier colonies of uh, the, uh, the powers and then became free, India is a shining example where continuously it has been a democracy for the last 70 years. We have been democratic but we have also done economic development. Our poverty has come down drastically. From our time in 1947, when our illiteracy rate was 35% for men and uh, women and 37% for men, we are now reaching close to 74, 73%, 74% in a country of our size. I mean, 1.2 billion is not a joke. It's, it's a very huge country. We used to uh, be on recurring famines and droughts importing food till 1960s. And then we had Green Revolution. Today we are food surplus. We export food. So we have traversed a huge, uh, you know, kind of journey. And I think in this, we haven't given our politicians enough credit, which I think we should. Thank you so much, sir, for discussing your journey being an administrator. So my next question is, as per a recent report by Niti Aayog, Rajasthan has ranked 12th in the Innovation Index as compared to 13th, which was last year. So how you see this overall development of Rajasthan? How you see this rank as the overall development of the, uh, of the state? See, basically, innovation requires freedom. Because... Uh, much of the innovation or innovation index, which Nitya uh, yeah. also created, is driven by uh, you know tech startups, the new uh, young people getting into the startups and you know experimenting with technology, coming up with newer products uh, for both uh, you know improving services and uh, consumer interface, even product development. Uh, this can happen if you free them from the day-to-day -day hassles of dealing with the system. So last year, uh, in uh, last uh, year, I mean, uh, in 2020, uh, 2019, actually, uh, in Rajasthan, we brought a law, which is called the Rajasthan MSME Facilitation Act. Uh, and under this act, we said, under all state laws, laws of Rajasthan, every state law of Rajasthan, no MSME, which is media, micro, small, and medium in, uh, enterprises, they will not require any prior approval from any government department. And no government officer will inspect any of these units for a period of three years from the date of registration. Which means that if tomorrow you want to come to Rajasthan and start doing something, you don't have to go to any government department to take any permission of, or approval. And for three years, you can experiment with it. If your enterprise works, very good. If it doesn't work, try something else. So this gives you that freedom. And that's why I think in, in, in Rajasthan, we are seeing a lot of uh, growth in this particular startup sector because people are now not bothered about going to to government departments, the transaction cost has come down uh, tremendously. 
And uh, that, I think, is the way to go forward. We have been urging the government of India also to come up with a similar act, which would provide similar dispensation of freedom from any prior approval or any kind of uh, 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 NOCs from the government of India under any central act. If that comes true, then in the country, you will see a true burgeoning of, uh, of the, uh, in the area of innovation, and uh, a proliferation in the number of uh, startups uh, by people such as you, the younger people in the economy. Absolutely, sir. You talked about a very important topic, startups. And it has right now a very great significance in the entire country. All the young minds are striving towards it to be an entrepreneur. And that's quite amazing for all of us. And we also hope that Rajasthan follows the same path of success and even... <laughs> and even grab more ranks in that innovation index. Now, thank sir, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, sir, in your recent two interviews, I, which I saw, you said that the central government should give uh, the states freedom to devise their own economic strategies. And you also said that emphasis should be laid on center state synergy in meeting economic challenges. How do you see both these statements working together? No, I think uh, I didn't say that uh, center should allow more uh, freedom for economic because that exists. The question is not the freedom to do a strategy. The problem arises from the manner in which the constitutional structure is in terms of the management of the economy. So the management of economy, if you see the monetary policy, for instance, works in tandem with the central government or central fiscal policy. If you look at the fiscal deficit area of fiscal deficit, for instance, the government of India has the levers to determine whether they would want to give a relaxation in fiscal deficit for to the state governments or not. They, are, they have the power to, for instance, raise finances and provide finances to the state governments. Ever since the GST come, has come and several of the state taxes have got subsumed in GST, the resource, uh, the, the, the autonomy to raise resources has shrunk as far as state governments are concerned. So I can have a strategy for economic development, which is autonomous, but I don't have the money to be able to execute it. And that can only happen if the central government works very closely with the state governments in being able to devise uh, the, the kind of interventions which are required, especially in times of difficulty like pandemic, uh, where the, the, uh, you require fiscal stimulus and so on, which can only come from government of India because the instruments for, for uh, providing that lie with government of India and the state governments do not have that facility. So I meant it in that context, that the gov there is a need for closer collaboration between the center and the state governments to deal with the kind of situation we are seeing today, or the kind of situation we saw in the last nine months of the pandemic, where if you know that in the first quarter, the economy shrunk in a, in a never before situation of a close to 25%. And this year, we are going to, on March 31st, we are going to end up with a contraction in the economy, which may be close to 10%. Now, this is unprecedented. I mean, we haven't seen contraction in the economy, even though the economy was growing slowly for all these years since independence. But the, the contraction in the economy is, is, a, uh, is something which is exceptionally serious. If the state governments and the central government had worked together, and uh, if the central government had been more mindful, perhaps we could have avoided being in such situation like this. This is what I have been writing, and this is what perhaps you may have read uh, in the articles that came out. So 2020 has been a very difficult year, especially for the economy. With a series of lockdown, hating all economic activities, even you have uh, also shown this in your uh, in your previous answer. But so recently, we have seen signs of economic recovery. According to you, what force is at a play behind this revival, or basically what sectors? Uh, see, there are two things we must remember. If a with the country of our size, which is one point three billion people now, purely existential consumption 
by the people itself provides a certain momentum to the economy. And therefore, inevitably, the moment you allow economic activity to begin, you would see that what we say is a revival. So revival is if this year, for instance, we are growing at 5%, you're growing on the 5% is also the base effect because you have been minus 10%. So 5% on minus 10% actually you, this year also the economy will not be at the same level in terms of numbers. It will not be at the same level as it was, say, in 1919. So the revival needs to be seen in a particular perspective. We are, uh, so I don't see this as a, as a revival in the sense where I should be very extremely happy because some part of it will happen. But what, two things we are not, we are missing out on. One is that the, this year, it is in true for most of the uh, developed countries, economies, developing country economies. Uh, they have the number of poor have increased, but the largest number of poor in, in India. I think we are now going to have larger number of poor than you have in a country like Nigeria, for instance. These are the recent World Bank report brings out this very starkly. So we the one is number of people have become uh, who have fallen back into poverty. You must remember that between 2005 and 2014 or uh, 15, 2015, close to uh, 27 million people. Uh, the, uh, I mean, sorry, 270 million people, that 27 crore people came out of poverty. This again is our reports that I have also quoted in my articles, that this is the kind of, uh, this was unprecedented in terms of contraction of poverty, where the country saw so many people coming out of poverty. But this year, we are seeing a very large number of those people falling back into poverty, which is the first thing that we must remember in terms of the recovery that we are talking of. And the second thing is inequality has increased tremendously. So whereas we are seeing, for instance, a tremendous growth in the sale of luxury cars or cars or luxury cars, we are not seeing the similar kind of uptick on two wheelers. So you can see that the, the kind of the recovery that we are seeing is also skewed. Uh, and this is going to result in much greater uh, inequality in the country than it was before. So these two are very clear signs that something is not really right with the economy, even while we see, uh, as people say, green shoots of economy uh, in terms of coming back uh, or reviving. Absolutely, sir. I think if I quote some of the words of you, um, economic uh, recovery and uh, poverty, inequality, one thing that uh, comes to my mind that what do common people think about solving these issues, then um, among top of the list, there will be fiscal budget. So as the budget is approaching, sir, uh, with low oil prices and all time low imports, it will be much needed. There will be a much needed fiscal space to the government. How should the government utilize this opportunity according to you? So I think uh, you must remember that it doesn't create a fiscal space for the government. It, I mean, it makes government very comfortable with regard to current account deficit. But on fiscal space, it doesn't provide because uh, low imports have very little bearing on the fiscal situation. I think what is important to, uh, for us to remember is that there has been a near complete demand destruction. The consumption has gone down for two reasons. One, of course, people didn't have money. A lot of people have lost jobs. Salaries have got cut, uh, you know, because of the lockdown. A lot of uh, people in the informal sector were not being able to earn livelihoods and so on. So there, therefore, the um, the uh, surplus available in the hands of the people to go and spend has come down quite drastically, and therefore the demand has been suppressed. Now, but two also is the fear of the future, because people are not really sure of how what is going to happen in the future. Whatever money they have, they are also also saving. They are not spending that money. So demand is is very low, and we need to uh, look at demand from also the perspective of the other three 
uh, you know, kind of cylinders on which the, the economic engine fires. Exports are down. Private investment is down. So private investment has not really come up in a big way. And government expenditure is also lower than what it ought to have been uh, because of the constraints, fiscal constraints. Now, I have been uh, uh, an advocate, like many, many other more eminent economists uh, have been, about uh, what I say a positive shock to the economy. The positive shock to the economy is where the government comes up with a fiscal stimulus package, even if it means borrowing money, more money, which means that breaching the fiscal discipline uh, because this is a one time or, uh, you know, kind of uh, a shock that is required to be given to the and provide a lot of liquidity in the hands of the people to be able to go and spend. Government did come up with this 500 rupees per month amount to be transferred into the accounts of all women account holders under Jandhan. But 500 rupees a month for a family is hardly uh, some which one could be proud of. So I think we have not done enough. Uh, there was an opportunity we could have, uh, the government could have put a lot more money in the hands of the people and which would have created a virtuous cycle and uh, perhaps the economy would have revived quickly and in a better way. But even now, in the budget, I hope that the government does have uh, some, some uh, major intervention in the form uh, in the budget to be able to revive the demand in the economy. The consumption has to go up and for that demand has to be created. That can only happen if it is in the, if there is enough money in the hands of the people. So that I, I hope that the government of India would be taking note of that. Absolutely, sir. The importance of demand again, the question, the same question has arrived. Um, Yes, we can hope, but the budget lies in the hands of finance ministry. But now you're a part of yeah. government of Rajasthan. Sir, we are seeing a lot of comment, a uh, lot of questions actually in the comment section. So there is a very detailed question and I was reading it. And can Sardar, can you read it for sir? <laughs> yeah, sure. So sir, this question has been asked by Madhav and you have also uh, quoted this in your uh, previous, an uh, previous answer. So the question is, in 2014, G20 deputy meeting after the beginning of the first term of NDA, you said and quote, I am confident that this will be the growth oriented and would deepen the reform process. At that meeting, you also compared the reform process to the necessary bitter medicine to revive the ailing economy. But now that the government has introduced, introduced reforms such as labor reforms and farm bills, they are facing high resistance from the public. Do you feel concerned by popular public moments uh, derailing the reform process. I think, sir, we are reading this in our macroeconomics also that sometimes yes. protests and public movements um, stop reforms. But at that time, we are seeing only the economic aspect of it. But it will be great if you can combine some social aspect with economics. No, but I, if you remember, I said it right in the beginning that yes, the basically policy making is consensus building. Now, I would certainly have thought that if these laws had been introduced and there had been a big uh, and a debate was allowed to take place in the parliament, the opposition party, ultimately all the members of the parliament, whether whichever party they belong to, represent people because they have been elected by the people. So they, they bring people's aspirations into the parliament and a debate takes place. If debate had taken place, if it had been sent to the select committee, they had examined it, taken on board the objections, tried to convince people, it would have taken a little longer. I mean, I'm sure it may have taken instead of, uh, you know, 15 days in which it kind of was, uh, first it came out as an ordinance, so there was no discussion and then it was introduced and, uh, you know, next day it was passed. If it was not done in such a hurry, uh, possibly uh, there would have been a better buy-in for reform uh, with some modifications in what has been done till now in these. You may have seen that uh, there would have been less, uh, uh, you know, vociferous or noisy opposition to this than what we are seeing today. So consensus building is very important. Reforms cannot be in, in a vacuum or in isolation. 
they impact the people and therefore people must believe that they will it is not so if i if i may quote there has been a very old saying that uh, you know you should not only be fair but you should also appear to be fair and similarly the reforms must not only must not be for the good of the people but also appear to be good for the good of the people and we need to convince people on that and we have had reforms in the past this is not the first time we have had reforms i mean it is it is a wrong belief that this is the first attempt at reforms in 1991 reforms were much more drastic than what this are but they were accepted i mean there wasn't any big agitation on those reforms uh, because they, the people were informed of how important it is parliament debated on it there were discussions and then it uh, went through so i think we need to, uh, i mean at the the establishment at this point of time in, you know, have to, has to understand that a consensus building is a very important part of political process and you cannot have diktats you cannot just sit and say i'm saying it so you have to accept if you don't accept you know it's my way or highway that doesn't really work in in a democracy absolutely sir you guided the, this term reforms very correctly and uh, sir continuing this you your works and reforms are internationally acknowledged but your contribution and work on public private partnership is the one that gets highlighted the most so sir given the disruption caused by the pandemic last year on the whole economy how do you see this affecting the ppp in short term and as well as long term and sir i would like to add to this that recent privatizations of some crucial sectors have been witnessed by the indian economy how do you relate this relate this with your ppp vision so let me say the let me make a distinction between privatization and public private partnership there is a major difference between these two and i think most of the time because we are not able to you know get across to people uh, the the real difference between these two uh, there is a, a propensity to mistake uh, public private partnerships as privatization it is not privatization is where public assets are transferred permanently in the hands of the private uh, owner so public ownership is transferred to uh, private ownership uh, and it's a permanent transfer it is like selling something that you sell your car and then the car becomes the property of somebody else that is privatization public private partnership on the other hand is the asset remains in the hands of the public which means a road for instance will be a public road and the the land on, on which the road has been constructed remains ownership of the government we are only bringing the private sector in to construct that road with its own money and maintain it for with set standards for a period of time say 20 years or 30 years and through toll recover its investment and then transfer this asset back to the government at the end of that period so government ownership never changes it remains owned by the government and this is where i think people must remember whenever there is a ppp people say nahi we, we don't want privatization privatization is not good for you know it is not privatization so the uh, responsibility so if you have a road or if you have a hospital for instance if you have a public private partnership hospital and it does not deliver people can still ask the government that your this hospital is not functioning well because for people it is a government hospital even if it is managed by the private sector but it is will still continue to be a government hospital so i think we have we can actually mobilize a lot of private sector capital as well as efficiency uh in managing services better public services better and for with greater customer uh, you know satisfaction if we can actually get across to people the real meaning and value of public private partnerships which we have not done as yet enough absolutely sir the difference between privatization and ppp um, you made it very clear for for the students watching you um, are we getting questions from chat box a lot <laughs> so there is a question this one 
Azbai or Aman? Sir, so, uh, so Manav has asked that you have been the finance secretary and then the chief economic advisor to a state. Are these terms overlapping or are they more or less similar in functioning? All, uh, although they must be different, but can you highlight what is the uh, major difference between these two terms and in the way you uphold your duties as an administrator? So uh, as finance secretary, I was a public servant in terms of employee of the government. I drew a salary. I had a very defined role. So there were things that I needed to be uh, do, for instance, making the budget or, uh, you know, uh, dealing in with external economic relations uh, with, uh, you know, so all these things were part of my remit, looking after the stock, you know, capital markets, development of capital markets. These were part of my responsibility mm-hmm. as uh, and it was a defined response. As an advisor to the government, I would be looking at uh, those aspects where certain reforms, I believe, are going to be important. But I'm not part of the day-to-day administration of the state government. I'm not part of that. So I know, I mean, I don't receive files or I do not receive uh, references which I have to get processed and take decisions on those. Uh, I have, I think I've done enough of that in 37 years of my so now I'm more in terms of being able to provide inputs where uh, the government believes I can uh, provide a different perspective than what is available to them. But that is about it. That's that's my role. Absolutely, sir. Now you have been at so much higher at the at highest position in the finance ministry, and then now you are the chief economic advisor to the Rajasthan's chief minister. But sir, we all know that you have a doctorate degree in finance. And I would just want to take the conversation towards that side by asking you that there have been a recent, a very great hike in gold prices. Do you see this as beneficial for the, the especially the Indian economy or um, later in the future, will, uh, will this be um, on the opposite side uh, for, the, for our economy? Gold. Gold yes, price, sir. yes, sir. No, so gold is never good for the Indian economy. It is not because our private consumption of gold is very high. And uh, so we, I mean, because we spend close to, and we don't produce gold in the country. So we import gold. Most of my um, is imported. So we import gold, which is, uh, you know, close to 50 to $60 billion worth of imports every year. And uh, if you physically stop importing, then smuggling starts taking place. And so you run into different other diff- other kind of problem. So I think it is never good for the Indian economy. Although, I mean, prices, hike in gold prices doesn't hurt the government to that extent. Uh, if it in some way suppress- suppresses the demand, but I've seen that there is very little suppression of demand of in gold even when the prices rise, because people somehow in India, we have this obsession with gold. I mean, once I was abroad uh, and uh, somebody in a joke asked me, do Indians love to eat gold? Because they import close to six six to seven hundred tons of gold every year. So what do they do? Do they eat gold? And I mean, and it's, it's it's really astonishing because if the world production of gold is somewhere around 25 to 27 hundred tons a year, we are almost 50% imports are by India. So, I mean, there must be something that we do with gold. Uh, I don't know what we do with it, but uh, there is an obsession with it, but it is not good for the country because it takes away a lot of our precious foreign exchange and has puts a pressure on our current account deficit. Sir, while you were answering this, um, now gold, someone has asked a question regarding petroleum and foreign exchange. So if I exactly quoted, how can we handle the rise in price of petroleum and rise of foreign exchange? And no, the question so is asked by Anmol. Once again, I think uh, petroleum is the same issue because the there is very little elasticity of demand in this because whatever the price is, people still buy petrol because people still need to drive and people still need to do things. Our uh, public transportation is done through that. Uh, now, of course, trains have been mostly electrified, but 
but road transport is still dependent on petroleum so we don't have that kind of elasticity of demand uh, the the uh, prices are high in india because they provide a lot of revenues to the government so if you can see the excise duties on petrol products is extremely high with little justification but i guess it is just like a uh, the golden goose which lays golden eggs so <laughs> you just take a lot of excise duty or on on it on import if it is basically the same thing because we don't produce petroleum whatever we consume has to be imported but there has been a recent uh, push towards electrification of uh, vehicles uh, road transport vehicles and uh, if that happens i mean the, i mean what the uh, ministry of surface transport tells us would like us to believe is that by 2030 they would want to push a complete transition to electric vehicles and a lot yes. of development has taken place in on uh, vehicle uh, the, the batteries which are used uh, to enhance the life of these batteries also in the sense of their capacities um i think uh that is that may be a good move but the whole question is where how would we produce that much of electricity so then again they say solar power may be the one which will answer that question we have to see i mean these the changes are so rapid uh now that it is very difficult to predict anything at this point of time very correct so so there is another question so we are getting a huge a lot of questions in our comments so the, this question is asked by um aman so sir what is the best and worst thing you feel about indian economic system the best and the worst yes sir very dynamic question like very a very vast question actually <laughs> best of course is if we can convert our demographic dividend i think we would have a tremendous advantage young people like you i mean if they are able to uh you know we are able to provide them the right kind of skills to deal with uh the emerging you know use technology as we were talking about startups and things use technology uh to contribute to the economy in a big way i think that is the strongest point part point of our economy at this point of time i would say the worst of course again is the the population because the growth in population eats up whatever benefits we accrue from the kind of acceleration in growth so we need to continue to work towards redu- reducing uh, the population growth rate which uh, is still alarming sir i think playing two more questions one is by anmol um sir now they have got to take some advice from you regarding investments they are saying that uh, amar anmol is saying um, you are from finance side so can you please tell something about investment in gold etf i can't actually because <laughs> i am banker uh, and my advice may be really off the mark so i would suggest talk to some smart young investment banker who would be able to provide you good ad- advice uh if you go by my advice you just your investment might just get bombed <laughs> sir manav is asking a very interesting question like now nowadays we are having very much shift towards being self sufficient but do you really believe that in coming years we will be able to be self sufficient especially um in case of maybe uh, at least a few sectors like uh communication transportation and uh, even civil aviation etc so see there are two things uh, i i think that is where we are making a mistake self sufficiency is a good thing which means that if we are able to create capacities within the country it's it is going to be obviously a uh, very beneficial to us but that capacity must not be built based on shutting out the world uh you know through tariff barriers or non tariff barriers so oh, if we are going to shut out the world and we will uh, you know kind of whatever we have benefited from globalization if we are going to shut that out then our self sufficiency will actually be like being uh, able to walk but 
uh, we need to be competitive and competitive globally. So therefore, when we strive for Atmanirbhar uh, Bharat or we strive uh, for uh, self-sufficiency, it has to be uh, based on being competitive and globally competitive. Unfortunately, the government and everyone else believes Atmanirbhar can come only, and even it's not just with India, it is true, true for US and many other countries, that you raise... Uh, you know, the boundaries and you stop uh, global trade, you stop people from trading across, you create a lot more barriers for uh, uh, trading, you know, uh, in, uh, free trade, uh, they, that it will make us self-sufficient. I think it's a, it's a very poor strategy and will give us very poor dividends. We will end up paying much more for much poorer services or products than we were doing earlier because we are no longer required to compete with the global prices or global standards. Sir, there is another question from Sharad. Sir, you have also have been an investment promotion expert with U UNCTAD. So what do you feel is deficit in global economic system? How can we overcome it? No, I, I don't think that's that question uh, really is kind of complete. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the global economic system in terms of investment promotion. I think what is deficit for us, why India is a problem is because we have, uh, we are an over-regulated economy. So for everything, we have the government intervention in every space is a problem. For instance, we have gone hammer and tong after uh, bad debts. We are. You must have heard a lot of NPAs like non-performing assets and so on. Now there can be non-performing assets can be because of fraud, but every non-performance for performing asset has not been created because of a fraud. So uh, the bankers can also have a error of judgment, or even the person who has taken a loan may have genuinely taken a loan and his business actually bombed and he just could not repay it. So we are not able to look at it in a nuanced manner. We believe whoever has not paid the loan wo chore. So therefore he has to be arrested. So CBI has to file a case and the ED has to file a case. And these people have to be put behind bars. The banker who gave loan has to be put behind bars. And this is how the society responds or reacts. Our, so we are not truly uh, giving that kind of... Uh, uh, and environment where people would like to come and invest, like like I had mentioned earlier, when we said that no for three years no prior approval is required and no government uh, inspector can go and inspect a startup uh, industry uh, unit for uh, you know when they start doing business, it has given us tremendous impetus for people to start experimenting because they are not worried, they are not afraid that some inspector will come and uh, start telling him that the the uh, the chair you have put in your uh, room should have been facing the window and it is facing the door. I mean, and therefore we are going to file a, a penalty against it. So we are highly over-regulated economy and that is why we don't attract a uh, lot of uh, investment, which otherwise we could considering the size of our uh, markets with the, with the kind of population we have. It's a tremendous opportunity for investors to come and invest and start producing here. We, they don't because we are highly regulated. And when you are highly regulated, it also results in a lot of corruption. So that, I think, is a problem with our economy as far as the investment is concerned. Absolutely, sir. Um, thank you, sir, for answering the questions from the audience. Um, thank you, audience, for being so inquisitive and um, I think, sir, from with, with this, we can arrive at the final question for today, which will be the most important question because many young minds are watching you. So, Sardak, you can ask this question. <laughs> sir, the question is very simple, but still a difficult one. Sir, any message that you want to give to all our viewers? So, we have talked to such an inspiration person. So, sir, any message? Message is that the there is a very old... Uh, saying from the scriptures, from the, from the Old Testament, it says, your young men shall dream dreams, your old men shall see vision. For there, where there is no vision, 
people perish so as young people you must dream you must dream big you must dream of a great tomorrow you must dream of a great country that you are going to make i think it's very very important to dream and that's the message i'd like to give to all of you today very well said sir very well said sir and thank you sir for this amazing insightful session your words have definitely motivated of all of us and this session has enhanced the importance of uh, understanding the administration of our country amongst all the students who are watching you throughout india for me personally it was a great pleasure to meet you sir all the virtually and thank you sir for giving us time from your busy schedule thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you very much for inviting me i really enjoyed our conversation and all the very best प्रथम
you all enjoyed our last session. Now it is time for our next speaker, Ms. Mitali Nikol. Mitali, ma'am, is a world-renowned economist and a writer. She has completed her bachelor's degree in economics from Hindu College, University of Delhi. She later went to London School of Economics to pursue a master's in economics. She has worked at UN Women, the World Bank, and is currently working at Asian Development Bank as an economist. She also founded Nikol Associates, a youth-led economics research think tank. We welcome you, ma'am, wholeheartedly to this conclave. Now, I would like to hand over the mic to ma'am so that she can share her knowledge and wisdom with everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, Anisha, and uh, thank you to the entire organizing team. And also a big thanks to my team at Nicole Associates for helping me prepare for today's session. So, um, you know, today's session, I think, uh, is on several topics. There are a number of ideas that, you know, everybody wants to cover. For example, you want to cover the COVID impact, you want to cover gender, you want to cover... Um, also, I saw that you have some questions about my own experience in being a policymaker. So, you know, uh, I'll be very happy to finish a bit early, like in 15 minutes, I'll finish my remarks. And then, you know, very happy to take questions from the audience and from the organizing committee, um, you know, so that we can dive deeper into a number of areas. What I, what I want to start off today with uh, saying is, I mean, I want to ask, actually, I don't know if we have the provision to do a small poll or uh, something like that, because I actually can't see the audience in this setup. Uh, in many of the other speak speeches, I'm normally able to see the audience. But, uh, you know, I, and I really enjoy audience interaction, but that's okay. I think the one question that first I want everyone to just take a minute and then, you know, maybe some of the organizing committee can answer the question is what do you think the impact of COVID is going to be on your life? You know, two years down the line, three years down the line, when you all graduate, when you come into the job market, um, do you think that you will get the same kind of jobs that you thought you would when you entered into your degrees? And what do you think will happen to consumer demand? What do you think? Do you think we'll have a lot more online ways of interacting, doing things? Or do you really think that, you know, we'll be back to uh, the way uh, we used to do business, you know, post vaccine? Do you think that we'll be back to doing, uh, you know, seven day work weeks in an office environment? Or do you think we'll have more work from home? Uh, so these are some questions that, you know, I just want everyone to ponder on a little bit, maybe as we start. And, uh, you know, Tanvi, maybe you can also offer your views. Um, Tanvi from Nikol Associates has also joined us today. So, you know, Tanvi, maybe uh, you can get the ball rolling and, you know, maybe just tell us what do you think that, you know, how do you think COVID is going to impact all our lives and this crisis? How do you think it's going to impact all our lives? Uh, sure, Mitali. I think I just uh, take a student's perspective here only. When I joined, uh, you know, my degree, uh, the I, I, I had big hopes. No, I, I'd not be lying over here. I thought that, you know, the placement package and whatever, uh, you know, those things. But then uh, now it's become, I think, a, a lot more competitive for us. And uh, the last couple of months with the placement process, I won't deny, have been a little bit uh, dejecting and depressing, if I can be that negative. But yeah, uh, there's still hope because, you know, we still continue applying because that's what we can do. But I think if we, if we as students can see this impact, this is definitely the closest that, you know, the pandemic has hit us. And with regards to business, I, I see my father talking about he, uh, he's in the rice industry. And, you know, since all these hotels and big chains, they're not having... Uh, the demand per usual so the businesses are hit for sure mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's you know the environment closer to home mm -hmm. and if anybody else could just want to take it from there so maybe one of the organizers uh sahaj aman anisha mm -hmm. sure ma'am um i definitely feel that as you talk about consumer demand and domestic demand they've definitely gone down me myself being a student of economics i studied a lot about it lately so um, yes, there has been a lot of impact of COVID on the coming times. Predicting the future is tough, but I'm not sure whether this phenomenon or this impact will go away very, very soon. Like we have experienced a lot of things happening in the past, which were put into the Indian economy for that matter, like demonetization. Some of mm -hmm. us, some of the economists even think that the, those impacts still last. Mm -hmm. Though that lightning that had happened in the year 2016, in the month of November, 
some impact is still happening some it's something still happening with the economy with banking sector increase in npa something something like that so even in my opinion i completely agree with tanvi ma'am that maybe the job market maybe the market of laborers might not recover as soon as we think it should hmm absolutely and anyone else aman maybe yes ma'am uh, adding to the point that sahaj made uh, the first thing that i want to say is regarding the impact of the pandemic is it brought us to thinking about in in the respect of the job market that what skills uh, are we providing to our, to the students hmm. who are about to graduate because uh, earlier those skills like some basic skills were pretty uh, easy to get a job in the market but right now the industry is looking for someone who is uh, not just good at one thing but in several things and right. this is this is what making the job market especially tough for someone who is just about to graduate or is just graduating other than that uh, i don't see uh, we are going back to seven weeks a day of the job that you talk about because even in the uh, earlier pan- uh, earlier when the pandemic started most uh, prominent tech companies example like twitter and facebook said that they are giving a whole year for their employees to just stay at home and do their work from the home Hmm. so and major banks uh, i'm not sure about the indian banks but in the us bank like jp morgan chase and morgan stanley has al- al- also uh, given part time to their employees that they can do most of their uh, work from their homes so i think this will be the new norm no absolutely and uh, you know this so this is what i wanted to you know sort of highlight as we start that this pandemic is going to influence all of our lives in ways that some ways that we can see it's evident and some ways that we can't see so let's have a look at some of the data now and and see what is already evident to us in terms of the macroeconomic impact and i'll just share my screen and here we go so when the lockdowns and the first wave of covid hit and a lot of economies were closing down there were three or four ways in which the economic impact started playing out the first was the trade impact because trade why was trade the first to be affected because of border closures so at that time you know you started seeing lower tourist arrivals and revenues and the tourism industry it was badly hit there was of course much much lower goods trade as well you know you in fact in india particularly there were stories of how in march and uh, april and in in may as well a lot of ports were clogging up because port officials weren't able to process um, you know the trade and the cargo because of uh, covid restrictions and new norms um there was a whole supply shock on the economy and and this happened pretty much across economies where you know with lockdowns production disruptions happened labor was not available people were not allowed to come to manufacturing sites you also saw the same thing on the demand side uh you know if people are not going to step out of the house if people are not going to go to work if people are not going to go to study uh their consumption demand patterns will completely change so there might be a higher demand for say electronic goods uh, like televisions or fr- refrigerators or mobile phones or laptops you know and and such accessories because you know that's what you use when you are at home versus other goods that you might have required when you move out like say automobiles so there was a lower con- but also you don't require that many things overall your consumption basket has not only changed it's also become smaller and because people are losing jobs and there's a you know production disruption demand shrinks even further and on the back of all of this you have weaker investment growth so the entire cycle itself becomes a vicious cycle of reduced uh, demand and then supply and then reduced demand and then reduced supply and overall trade is also low now uh the, what is the policy response typically to this of course we have to increase health spending because in health sector is where you had the major crisis with covid and you needed to obviously that is where the demand was not falling in a sense right you needed to invest in more and more health workers and health infrastructure and then you needed an overall fiscal stimulus which many of the countries did 
implement last year and will continue to implement this year as well. Now, when I look at overall GDP growth rate projections, they've been by different agencies. India's uh, GDP growth projection ranged between, say, 9% by ADB, which is, and even the World Bank growth projection has now been changed to minus 8.1. Um, minus 3.2 was sort of at the time when uh, I think about a month ago, and now they've again changed their, you know, lowered their growth projection actually. OECD putting it at the worst at minus 10.2. And then when we compare, say, the IMF projection to other countries, we can see that though it was being it was being projected that India would have one of the best sort of outcomes. Uh, you know, when we compare with countries like Japan, Russia, US, Brazil, UK, France. Um, you know, there was a major, major collapse across the developed world. The issue is that in India, you know, even if you have a 5% or 6% reduction in the GDP growth, the inequality is so high and poverty rates are so high that the lower classes are going to feel the crisis much, much more deeply than, you know, in developed countries where inequality is a bit better. And overall poverty rates are on much, much lower. Of course, the impact of COVID has been uh, not very, very uniform across sectors. There are some sectors which have come out of it looking much worse, like auto components, auto, aviation, retail, tourism, construction, because now how many buildings do you even need? There is residential, I mean, there's not even residential demand in, in urban uh, clusters because people are, you know, working remotely and they don't have to, they, nobody is making investments or purchases in large capital, uh, you know, related projects like housing. So you have a situation where a lot of sectors um, are doing okay, like they're surviving. Say, for example, pharmaceuticals is doing fine, food and agriculture are doing quite okay, consumer facing internet business is doing well, even petrochemicals are now reviving, power sector is okay, telecom is okay, you know, but transport infrastructure and logistics, logistics is the only thing which is really holding up transport, but logistics trade on the trade side, it's majorly disrupted. You know, so these, these sectors, there's been an uneven impact and some sectors have been really badly affected. Now, I'll skip this one, but I want to highlight this. Uh, overall, when we look at the situation in March, April, May, which was the you know, peak months of the lockdown, at that time, nearly 88% of rural households and 75% of urban households experienced income losses. And 40% of households across 12 states stated that they could not survive for more than two weeks without additional assistance, government assistance, or some kind of, you know, income support schemes. And middle income households were actually very badly hit because they were not part of the government support programs. They never actually got any, uh, uh, you know, government support. And they had to dip into their savings. So they were very, very badly affected. And the savings level are at an all time low at this point in time, because many people from middle income households actually lost jobs, which never came back. And they could not find, uh, you know, jobs elsewhere, which is why there was a sharp increase in unemployment. And overall, when we look at the unemployment and employment numbers, we can see that there's also a gendered impact because uh, rural women and urban women are actually the worst hit. Both rural and urban women were badly hit. And the overall labor force participation of women dropped by 30%, whereas for men it was a reduction of 13%. So, you know, while of course large number of men dropped out of the labor force, 50 million versus 15 million women, the proportionate impact on women was much higher because they were mu much lower in the labor force to begin with. And, uh, you know, even this came out even in terms of the employed persons. Now, another big uh, sector which got really badly impacted was MSMEs. Uh, nearly 79% of MSMEs who were surveyed by PwC in August, and that's several months after the lockdown was even lifted, said that they would have preferred to get some subsidy-based support from the government, which they never received in, you know, in, the, in any of the Atmanibhar packages. And, uh, you know, they require more support for boosting exports, for procurement, for grievance redressal. 
and uh, nearly 50% of msmes expect that in the you know q uh, fy 2020 21 Uh, there will be a reduction of forty-six to sixty percent in their profit margins, um, you know, over the over the year. Because you know, this was if the poll was done in August, and they said if the lockdown remains for another six months, the lockdown did remain for at least another four five months after this poll. And even right now, though the lockdowns are not in place, our uh, people are still not changing their behavior that fast. You know, people are not going out that much. um and the worst you know sort of group which was affected was urban workers many of them who went completely without pay in may and uh, may june and july and even obviously in in april as well and uh, you know for many of them said who were polled by an lse uh, team of researchers actually found that their earnings fell by nearly half you know in these months of april and may when compared to jan and feb and this uh, study was actually done in uh, about june and july so in 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 towards end of july so we don't know what happened after that yet that's still being studied but uh, you know in in between may and july they just went without any work pay financial assistance nothing reached them because these are undocumented informal urban workers who are like migrant workers so there is no guarantee that they have of any kind of work and uh, you know they they had to just survive at that point um and i've already discussed uh, the the point about gendered impact and i'll come back to recovery later but you know i'm going to stop here for now to say that this is the kind of chaos that we're dealing with you know and no one fully realizes this because it doesn't affect you on the same day in the same way and not everybody gets affected um especially in our families we are very very privileged we don't fully see this but more than 75 80% of india's population um is badly affected by this crisis because they live day to day they don't have savings and and even the middle classes who have minimal level of savings have sort of come to a point where their savings are starting to take a major hit and they've still not been able to get reemployed so this is the kind of crisis that we are in today you know in a macro sense of course there are a number of solutions which are being offered which are being uh, you know implemented we'll discuss those but in the questions but this is the main context that i wanted to lay out for for all of you Okay, so thank you so much, ma'am, for your insights on how COVID has impacted the economy. Now, I would like to ask Sahaj Kapoor and Aman Jha to begin with the interview session. Very good afternoon to you, ma'am. My name is Sahaj, and I am one of the members at FIC Arabata. Indeed, that presentation was great, and you very well laid out the macroeconomic situation of the country right now that happened due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. So, my very first question to you is: What do you think? What sort of professional impact? did covid 19 have on you being one of the business leaders and business women so for me actually uh, paradoxically covid has been very good <laughs> uh there are two reasons for that the first is that because i am a freelancer um and most of the agencies that i work with are involved in the covid response um my work actually quadrupled because i am part of the covid response team from adb to government of india and i am also working with uh, four governments india bangladesh bhutan and nepal on transport and logistics and we had to work like overnight to ease logistics and create systems for a post covid economy to keep trade going so uh, which is you know part of my world bank work and and we are working on now digitizing a lot of those systems and assisting the four governments to digitize a lot of their trade systems so because of covid we realized how many you know issues were there in the system and then we have now provided a lot of solutions to uh, to solve that and and now we are implementing that so you know because of covid i feel like a lot of the work which was stuck and it was difficult to convince governments that you need to digitize that uh, became easy 
another thing which happened because of covid is that in this again in this uh, eastern region where you know the bbim region is what we call it bhutan bangladesh india nepal um the situation was that road transport became slow so there was an interest in looking at alternate ways of transport and inland waterways turned out to be one of the ways that all four countries were like oh actually we have this entire riverine system why not start using this so world bank is now supporting in infrastructure development of inland waterways and i'm on that project as well so it has you know for me uh, it has it i mean i i have just got a lot more work and yes you, and i am now advising un women as well on the gender impact of covid and we are coming out with a number of knowledge series and i have also written a couple of blogs articles and i've recently submitted an academic paper also on the covid impact on women's employment in india so um and with you and women i'm doing a global advisory on the co- you know impact of covid on women so because of covid i think uh, i think because i'm in that whole space where i have to be part of response teams uh my work has only uh, quadrupled exponentially increased you can add any number to it um so nicor associates has grown a lot and uh, because of because of covid i would say i think uh, to be honest that wasn't an answer that all of us were expecting uh, we were really glad to know that you know the work has quadrupled it really reminds me of a situation in 2008 where 95 of the world's population had gone down but there was that 5% population which actually took advantage of that situation so that's that's how business uh, person feel <laughs> like adapt to situation I, I think it was a necessity at that time because you know when you are dealing it's almost like you are one of the soldiers in a crisis you know uh, we still are like i think as economists who advise governments and and international agencies we are like soldiers in this crisis because we are the ones who have to think of the policy solutions and who have to also do the data work to highlight how the impact is um on different sections especially on women because there are still not enough people highlighting the gendered impact of covid and bill and melinda gates foundation is putting a lot of funding into it into highlighting the gendered impact of covid but they are amongst the few um and you know even my own colleagues in world bank etc may not be fully aware that the impact is so gendered so i think that you know um it is up to us to highlight this that was indeed a great answer ma'am uh ma'am thank you once again we cannot have after watching the slide uh, that you presented we just i don't have any words because the numbers that you projected was fascinating and head 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 sketching ma'am in some ways uh ma'am my first question is more of my personal question because i want to use this opportunity as wisely as possible because i don't know if i can meet you in person in the future or so uh, ma'am because as a kid i always has aspired to become a leader successful leader and have an impactful life in life on life mm-hmm. but ma'am how was your life as a child and what led you to pursue economics as a career and later become an renowned economist um see i leave out the renowned part because i think i'm still very young um you know when you see people like ashwini desh pande or you see people like uh, you know john drees or any of these people who are you know uh, in this field then i think that they are the renowned ones we are the budding ones you know who are trying to follow in their footsteps so uh, they are the uh, you know sort of uh, leaders for us to to look up to uh, jayati ghosh for example you know these these are people who have lived in india and become as big um you know many many of the others who have gone abroad it's it i would say it's definitely easier to have an academic career when you are teaching uh, and and are fully absorbed into academia in uh, in developed countries because there's a lot more funding and there's a lot of uh, um you know publishing opportunities here it's uh, not easy to have an academic career and i don't have an academic career i think i have just stumbled into a number of things uh you know i my my dream was always to work with the un when i was a child uh and i did a lot of public speaking model un and in fact i was the founder of caucus the discussion forum the nun society in hindu which is still there and that's how mun came to du uh 
because we hosted the first international Hindu MUN uh, when I was in, in my first year. So, you know, MUN was like, okay, this it's so exciting. You know, you can just be in this room and dominate the room and be the loudest voice in the room. So, uh, you know, that was fun. And I think the reason why I was able to do all of that is because precisely my parents, I was very lucky uh, that my childhood was very stable. And, uh, you know, my parents were very supportive of everything I wanted to do. I was an only child. So I think like, you know, in terms of having the absolutely perfect conditions for having a good career, uh, they all existed in my personal life. So I, I fully acknowledge that privilege. And I fully say that, you know, I have met so many bright people in my career who I've mentored or who I've worked with. And maybe they are, you know, not able to reach their full potential because of personal problems and challenges and financial constraints and things like that. And the only reason I feel like I do what I do is because I didn't have any of those problems. And I and I need to give back because there are majority of people are not like me. They don't have uh, they're not as lucky to have such a stable life as as I did when I was growing up. Now, I'm not saying, you know, everybody's life changes. But at least when I was growing up, my parents always ensured I had a very good and, uh, you know, I got everything I wanted in terms of education, wherever I wanted to go, they were able to send me, there was no financial constraint. So I think that, uh, you know, the, that privilege is something I never want to throw away. That's why I'm, I'm using it for the work I do. And uh, the second thing which I feel is that, you know, as we as we research more, as we as we work more, the world around us is changing and inequalities are worsening. Uh, you know, it's on so many dimensions, uh, whether it's, you know, climate change based inequalities. Like if you are living in Bangladesh today, you are 10 times or 15 times more at risk of being caught in a flood than if you are living in, in an inland area. Right. So, um, you know, the coastal areas are exposed. Uh, the areas where you have extreme cold are exposed. So climate change is threatening our entire way of living. We are being threatened, you know, from uh, the perspective of uh, our own democratic freedoms are under uh, threat. We are, uh, you know, under threat with respect to like globally, I'm not just talking about India, but globally, there is this whole, you know, with social media and the way, um, you know, conversations happen, there's no room for debate anymore. You know, you can be a right, left, center supporter and yet be tolerant of somebody who happens to have views which are opposite to you. That is not happening with social media. Social media is making us more intolerant. Um, so I think that with the world being under the kind of threat that it is, I'm really just happy to contribute to the conversation. Ma'am, indeed, ma'am, that it was a very candid answer. Ma'am, following up to your answer earlier, you said the role of eco economist as a policymaker and in uh, very governmental decisions. But lately, uh, particularly, I have read a report by Harvard Business Review (HBR), and they reported the new change in the way economists work, especially in the private sectors. The new companies, let's just say, the tech revolts, the Netflix, the uh, mm -hmm. Twitters they are hiring more and more economists today than hmm. earlier before. So do you see what impact does this, does this have on the whole society? See, uh, it's interesting because a lot of the economists who are being hired by private firms are actually behavioral economics. You know, they are not uh, development economists. They are being hired because these companies can then tailor their products more and more and more to the behavioral characteristics and rational choices or irrational choices which agents will make in a free market. So at the end of the day, uh, when you're hiring a behavioral economist to fine tune your product offering even more, it's not for some kind of altruistic purpose, it's for driving up your profitability. You know, so um, at, at one level, it's great because it will make your products better and more suited to the demand uh, that, you know, more tailored to, in fact, individual demand and, and not assuming that a single product will meet everyone's needs. But at the same time, it's also a little more dangerous because, you know, uh, where do you draw the line between privacy and your data uh, being shared with a company? 
and and you know them then tailoring their product to match your um, you know previous clicks for example so you know it's it's a, it's a it's a slippery slope so i think that the contribution of economists is definitely very important um in terms of you know the behavioral side in terms of creating more and more choice and uh, that's great that you know these these firms are doing it but at the same time you need some kind of regulation to to make it stop you can't tailor everything to every single individual to this extent without impinging on their privacy thank you ma'am for that insightful answer ma'am thank you okay um so ma'am my question to you is and this is a question that i am very curious to know about so since april 2020 everything for the indian economy has gone down when the pandemic hit us uh, consumer demand has got down you you yourself mentioned that how msme sector has been struggling and even i think it was the previous quarter i think it was the second quarter of financial year 2020 2021 when i am predicted you also said that the indian gdp will go down and the actual gdp went down by you know much more than i think it was thrice of what they predicted mm-hmm. but still on the contrary we can see the financial markets booming um, in the last week sensex went up about 50000 points and right now it's currently around 48000 points and some of the financial advisors or even investment bankers have predicted that in the next couple of years sensex might go up to 1 lakh points so why is this happening because we haven't really seen any substantial economic growth to back these figures up but still like financial markets are booming yeah because there is very little connect between the real economy and the financial economy at the end of the day uh think about how many people see you must have heard the term financial inclusion i'm sure you've heard this term uh think about the the house help that works in your house does she have a bank account maybe yes because now jandhan has genuinely done very good work so they have a bank account and they have 500 rupees in that account which came by the jandhan yojana but they have not used that money all their transactions are still in cash a lot of the informal sector informal workers who are paid in cash then make expenses in cash and their entire life is run on those small transactions which the financial sector doesn't even care about but that's the major population so 70 or 80% of your population has no link with the financial market the people who are investing and working in the financial market are maybe the top 10 maximum 15% in terms of income right and they are just trading amongst themselves they are not trading with the rest of the population so they are deciding how okay today i own this company tomorrow i'll buy that one i'll i'll you know do this in the market and its valuation will change it has no link almost with the real gdp anymore i mean the financial markets are a source of private equity or public equity in that sense for investors to invest in any company which becomes public right but only those people who understand the financial market will be able to participate in it or who have the financial wherewithal so you need some basic level of income and savings to be able to participate you have such a small proportion of your population which can participate in that and also think about the gendered impact there there aren't many women who participate in financial markets they don't understand them they are excluded from them they are excluded from being traders they are excluded from being um you know holding any position so uh you know women bankers are there but they are not in equity so the simple thing is that the financial market is a very poor reflection of real gdp because of the extent of inequality that capitalism has created so it's just a i think it's just a funny thing for billionaires to just you know multiply their money and valuations i completely agree with your answer ma'am in fact um i agree to the fact that a lot of women are bankers but they are not actually traders who work for, who work as brokers at bombay stock exchange so do you think that in this pandemic you even talked about trade that how trade had stopped between international trade between countries 
um did it also affect foreign portfolio investment and foreign institutional investment between india and other countries definitely i mean fdis were at their fdi not even fii were at mm-hmm. one of the lowest points in uh, in i would say september um and and the reason for that is very simple if your own country is in a crisis if in the us or in the uk you're facing a liquidity crunch and you're not able to invest then how will you invest in a foreign country where you can't even control the covid spread right if covid is going to be so bad india has managed to attract investments in the last quarter simply because a the covid numbers are coming down and b there is a huge backlash against china with people not wanting to invest in china but that is also dying down because the chinese economy is reviving europe is going to china now they have signed a deal uh between europe and china for uh, free trade as well as for increased investment india is getting increased investment from uk and the us and japan so and uh, there's a whole you know sort of quad which has been created now with japan india australia and the us which uh, likely uk will join now that brexit is done and eu is going to go with china and russia also goes towards china so there's a huge like chism that is now you know coming up in the geopolitics um between india and china as investment destinations with a number of developed countries wanting to see india become um, a more credible economic rival to china but it can't happen without political will we need increased political will and investment in ease of doing business and in overall um, you know infrastructure investment for us to leverage this extremely historic opportunity um in in our you know collective global economic history never before has the interest in india been so strategic and so huge um they want to invest but we need to open our doors and and be able to absorb that money at this point we are not fully ready for it i completely agree with your answer ma'am and there's a famous saying that the financial market is driven more by sentiments than actual growth when people think that it is time to buy they just buy it because if you actually compare the market value of a company or a stock it's much different than what it was issued at and i also agree completely agree with the point that how geopolitical relations have been um, you know hampered by this lockdown where brexit happening britain exiting the european union and joining hands with countries like us and india for that matter japan as well and european union because they wanted to have a a superior power on their hand so they are going with china but in the end it all boiled down to russia china and us so i think that was really an insightful answer from you ma'am uh ma'am as you have talked earlier about your work in adb asian development bank so i just want to know what is asian development bank and how is it different from its peers like when we think of uh, world bank and imf and why was it need to develop an asian development bank particularly for asia and how do you see it impact its impact on the indian uh, indian uh, in the indian context as well as our peers like china and japan so um now you would know that there's also an asian infrastructure investment bank aiib which uh, which has primarily been capitalized by china and uh, there's also the new development bank which has been capitalized by the brics economies that's uh, you know it has a 25% equity contribution from all five brics countries and actually um so the difference is really in terms of the multilaterals who are part of these banks and driving the banks the countries and also what is their investment focus so when the world bank was set up post world war 2 uh, you know ebrd the uh, i mean european bank for reconstruction and development world bank that's ibrd international bank for reconstruction and development and uh, there were one or two other uh, you know entities like imf uh, which came up around the time um, the whole idea was that you know developed countries what we call developed countries today are in a major crisis and we need to invest in their infrastructure for rebuilding post the war um at that time world bank was not actually in you know at all investing in india or you know any of the developing countries it was primarily investing in and and the world bank was always a us driven initiative even at that time because the us if you remember during the world war was actually a 
neutral party till the very end so the whole idea for the us in in driving the whole bretton woods system and the uh, you know uh, the world bank etc was because the us economy was the least impacted by the wars you know britain had been devastated by the second world war so had france i mean though they had emerged victorious they had been devastated by the second world war their their economies didn't have the wherewithal to uh, you know there was no food literally there was a food crisis and germany to i mean you can't imagine like you know germany japan the axis powers were i mean completely broken so i think this was a way of sort of restarting the economic order in a more peaceful era where the us kind of took a lead and of course over time russia emerged and then had the cold war era now when the cold war era started about 50 years ago it was noticed by the us particularly but also by several other uh, asian economies which had started emerging you know like the republic of korea singapore it was a time when these countries were demanding more and more investment and it was also noted that these countries were giving much higher returns than investing in the traditionally developed economies so it was thought that for the asian economy there needs to be a separate fund where the asian economies can also contribute because at that time asian economies were not contributing to the world bank funding even now india does not contribute much to the capitalization of the world bank you know they are more a recipient country than a uh, donor country but in adb india is a very huge donor as well and and a lot of indian investments are directed towards smaller asian economies like maldives malaysia um uh, not so much malaysia but maldives and uh, uh, seychelles i mean and then even the the islands like uh, pacific islands etc which are all part of adb um which are you know part of a special uh, special interest group of countries of adb which are some of the poorest countries in asia which are often overlooked by larger organizations so you know it was noted that we need a special asia focused organization and that's when the adb was born and and uh, the world bank is one of the largest stakeholders in adb but so is japan japan uh, you know japan has a huge role in the adb which it doesn't in the in the world bank to that extent because it doesn't contribute that much to the world bank's capitalization as it does to adb so the way aiib is driven by china adb is driven by japan and then later on even the republic of korea started uh, contributing much more to adb as opposed to the world bank so you know that's why adb is such a strong organization because it has very strong asian economies and wants to focus more on asia intra intra asia trade and the entire asean trade block so there's a huge focus on transport infrastructure logistics infrastructure in adb as opposed to i mean even world bank does it but not i mean like with with adb it's like that is our primary focus whereas with world bank if you note know, uh, the way things have evolved world bank has become much more into social infrastructure like education health skill building you know it is giving loans at much more concessional rates because its loans actually are much cheaper because you get it you know from bigger donors like the you know eu countries and the uk and the us whereas here you're getting it from japan or south korea so you have different conditions of getting the loans and different sectors of focus so that's the main you know difference now but when they began the historical you know uh, focus was this and then uh, overall if you see different uh, groupings have come up like the inter inter american development bank african development bank because it was found that you need more capitalization for infrastructure development and these regional development banks understand their own regions uh, you know sort of paucities and deficits much better than than world bank world bank has its own advantage that you can bring in expertise from anywhere in the world when you need it um so i think but what is good is that world bank cooperates with all the regional banks so you know everything is in in you know in in uh, cooperation in these countries it's not a you know oh world bank ka wahan pe loan ja raha hai to adb ka nahi ja sakta it's not like that it's it's always in cooperation and in fact there are some loans which are 
uh, so big like in msme sector right now um, there's a joint lending between world bank adb and uh, you know two three other agencies of almost a billion dollars which is being pumped into the sector um for a post covid recovery and that can only happen if the agencies cooperate yes ma'am indeed ma'am uh, my uh, one question is that you talked about the stake of japan in adb and if i'm not wrong uh, us also has a uh, equal stake in adb also yes the stake of india and china are on the lower side so do you think that india should up its stake in the adb in the coming years i mean india has done a better strategy india has set up something called the national infrastructure investment fund niif um which is completely an indian uh, multilateral i mean i wouldn't say multilateral it's a bilateral infrastructure investment fund so in that you know it's actually a better way of doing things because niif can get into collaborations with foreign agencies foreign governments as well as indian um, you know agencies and that gives us a lot more flexibility than uh, diverting our funding towards multilateral bodies uh in multilaterals i think we are doing fine because we have breaks we have aiib also we are invested um you know we have a 10% stake there as well and in adb we have around a 5% uh, stake so and and we have now start contributing to world bank also like it's less than 1% but it's there um for some of the uh, you know highly indebted countries a lot of the indian funding is being used so i think that that strategy of diversification between different organizations is is good and can serve india much better given that we don't have the kind of financial wherewithal um as you know the us or or others indeed ma'am thank you ma'am thank you for your answer okay so ma'am although me and avan can really talk to you for hours but due to possibly of time i think um this will be the last two questions from me so my very first question is you mentioned that how um, even avan mentioned that how india stake is quite comparatively lesser than other countries in um places like world bank and imf and asian development bank but in imf the voting rights of country is determined by the amount of stake it has so i think india stake in that is less than 3% and us has the highest stake of 17% so it has the highest voting right basically whatever us thinks should be there imf follows that so do you think us should actually increase uh, india should try to increase its stake to let's say 11% or 12% to increase its voting rights do we have such kind of funds and infrastructure to do that okay and we okay we don't okay. we need to first become a you know look at the size of our economy what is the size of the indian economy in dollars today less than 3 trillion dollars less than 3 trillion dollars ma'am and what is the us economy size Ma'am, eleven trillion dollars, if I'm not wrong. Seven trillion dollars. Twenty-seven, and their one package is one point nine trillion. Their one economic package is one point nine trillion, which is equivalent to the size of our economy five years ago. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely true. So okay. you know, and and at the end of the day, we have a lot of domestic issues that we have not yet addressed. For example. you know before we start looking at international organizations we have to see why why is our economy even growing this much is not because people's incomes are growing it's because the incomes of the top 1% 1% 1 i'll are growing so just because two or three people are becoming billionaires or four uh, our economy is you know gdp growth rate goes up so we all know it's econ 101 right gdp growth rate does not tell you what is happening with per capita income so you have people who are falling deeper and deeper into hunger and malnutrition but at the same time you have the economy growing because you have two or three large industrialists whose wealth is quadrupling and you know we seem quite satisfied with this because it helps us increase the size of our economy but that's not usable because that's not public wealth like if we need to invest in imf uh, special drawing rights we can't ask mr ambani to purchase those for us the taxpayer has to do that but the taxpayer's wealth is not increasing because you know certain industrialists are not paying taxes so at the same time you know so it's very important that we have to widen our tax base we have to tax corporates more we have to uh, bring in more and more of wealth 
into taxation's ambit for nation building and we have to reduce inequalities otherwise you know we can always hand over government of india to certain foundations to run which are well capitalized probably more uh, capitalized than the government itself i completely agree with your point ma'am and um in a macroeconomic strata it is always said that for a developing country like india it is always better to collect more number of direct taxes the tax revenue should be more in terms of direct taxes and indirect taxes because direct taxes are determined by the amount of wealth you possess but apparently or unfortunately india's higher like tax percentage come from the indirect taxes that is gst exactly. so you need to curb that that's definitely a very good insight ma'am so my last question to you is that ma'am you possess immense knowledge about economics and financial markets and you also did masters in economics from the prestigious london school of economics a dream college for a lot of students here including me so what motivated you to study further a very very you know renowned subject like economics and your contribution to unw and gender inclusivity has been immense so what basically motivated you to take up this stance i just wanted a diplomatic passport mujhe abhi tak nahi mila hai Okay. I was told, I was told that you know if you do a PhD in economics, you'll pakka get a World Bank ka job, like you know international stuff, and then you'll get a UN passport. Um, I was talking, I mean, I was taking advice from some uh, you know relatives at the time, uh, you know, on family dinners and all. You say, what do you want to do, beta? I I want to go to UN, uncle, and I want to sit there. And ha ha, to do economics, but PhD kar lo, to tumara ho jayega. <laughs> you know, like how you. hear about these things so i think when i went for my masters uh, my eyes opened that you know okay economics is good and it's an interesting subject but maybe i don't want to do a phd right now or at least for another few decades until i get some gray hair because uh, i want to go in the field and and work in the field so i'm really enjoying working in the field but uh, what i do what i do suggest to everyone is that you know when you're trying to think about a masters degree especially in your time you know like the options are more when i went you didn't have a public policy masters for example um you know an mpp or an mpa is something that's just become very popular and has come in um like 5 7 years ago an msc in econ was the only option that we really had um which was prestigious enough for the dev sector but now you know mpp mpa are equally good so you know keep your options open and uh, again at the time when i was going you know there was a whole four years you have to sort of do four years of education in your undergrad and then you you can't go to the us now a lot of uh, a uh, us colleges are actually uh, waving away that requirement for for indian students from from du and um, from other colleges or you can always do like a one year fellowship on top of what you have in your du degree and then go to the us as well so i think you know uh, you are far more informed in terms of where to do your masters than than i think i was because um lse of course is great but uh i was lucky a lot of people did not get into lse and they went to warwick and other colleges warwick is again very good but then you sort of had other british colleges which aren't so good they did not get very good offers and they had to come back and struggle a lot to get a job even at that time even though we weren't in a recession in 2012 um so you know my point is that the uk is only one option um and for international development i don't think it's the best option um uh, the us is a far better far better place because you have the world bank headquarters you have a lot of other you know private foundations also who hire in the us and now with uh, you know the new administration coming into the us um there's going to be a lot more focus on multilateralism and international development which will hopefully stay for at least 8 years and beyond so you know we so that we are safe <laughs> definitely ma'am we'll take that into consideration i think a lot of students here are very much confused including myself that which country is a better option i'll definitely keep take your points into consideration whether i should choose us or uk um thank you so much ma'am for having this session with us for coming to our business conclave it was a great pleasure to have you here a person of your strata actually coming in addressing the students is commendable and me and aman i don't think we'll ever get this opportunity to address someone like you i think it means a lot to us thank you so much ma'am thank you so much
Again, no, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, it's entirely my pleasure. And uh, anyone who's interested in getting some hands-on experience in the field of public policy and dev sector can uh, apply to Decor Associates. We have uh, ongoing internship opportunities available for DU students throughout the year, especially those who are doing a bachelor's in economics. So just go to our website nicoreassociates.com and you can apply for multiple positions like research intern or if anybody likes you know uh, social media and they don't have an economics background then we have a social media team that we are just setting up and we also have you know we, since we are setting up a new startup we have admin roles and management roles also available um for those who are not doing economics so for the economics people it's a special corner you know in in like because we are an economics think tank so the research intern position is only for the econ students, but for the other students, we have other positions as well. And we also have a writing team, which we have recently set up, and an editing team. So English students actually are more than welcome at Nicole Associates to come and apply and uh, you know join our editing and writing team. Indeed, ma'am. Uh, our audience will be thrilled by hearing what you said <laughs> regarding the internships. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, so Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Now we will be showing you a glimpse of our next speaker until he joins. So kindly, everyone, stay tuned.
So hello audience, we are back now. Now we have with us Mr. Sunny Garg, a very uh, known personality. Sunny Garg is a 22 year old Delhi based entrepreneur trying to revolutionize the student housing industry. Ramjas College graduate and ISB dropout, he has always been a firm believer in paving his own path and doing his own things. He founded Your Shell in 2016 and I Circle in 2020. He is the youngest CEO to raise the funds through the Startup India scheme of Government of India. We are really glad to have you here. And also, I would like to invite Khushi and Gautam, who are the interviewers for today, and they'll carry out uh, their discussions with Sunny Garg. Thank you so much Khushbu, for the uh, intro. But the 22-year-old line is old now. I'm I turned 23 last year. You took I guess you took the intro from some past post. That was also my intro once. So basically, let me introduce myself a little. Uh, so I ran uh, a student housing company in North Delhi. The name was Your Shell. We had 600 beds. And recently we have been acquired by Stanza Living. Now I have started A Circle. A means anything and everything. And A also means A Sun. Ye kar le. A Sun wo kar le. That that very familiar and common phrase AE. So in A circle, we help students with their entrepreneurship uh, goals and other career goals. Basically, the problems which were faced by us while starting our own venture, we are helping other students so that they don't face those problems. We also help them with funding, mentorship, legal, finance, all of that aspects of business. Apart from that, the interview the intro you gave was all correct. And, so also, sunny, yeah. and also thank you, FIC Arya Bhatta, for having me here. Tum ki, jitne bhi speakers the, all the speakers I saw were very big shot guys. I thought I, I like I really think that I'm the kitna, youngest one and I'm the most Wo, smallest one of them. Koi MP hai, koi ye hai, koi KBC ke wo hai, expert. Mujhe aisa lag raha tha, mujhe kyu bula rakha tum logo ne yaar. Mujhe to baith ke sunna chahiye un logo ko. But at the same time, bhaiya, most of Hello? I guess Gautam went on mute. Okay. At the same time, bhaiya, the most excited we have been, the speaker we have most excited been for is you. So <laughs> as he has already welcomed everyone with, with, a, with warm words. We thank all of the people who are, who are watching us live from all over India. Sir, students from all across DU are watching you right now. And even oh, beyond that. Thank you so there. much everyone for Ketana, taking out time and coming here. And so the only reason we called you is that you it feels as if you are one of us. And the fact that you are so inspiring, you are hardly two years older to us. And the fact that you've achieved so much in these two years, that is very inspiring to us. And we have you here uh, in the hopes of becoming better people ourselves. Yeah, honestly, I am also one of you. Three years back or four years back, I was... Similarly, taking up, like calling up speakers. I was the president of the entrepreneurship cell of my college. I started that. So I was also doing the same things you guys are doing. And I haven't done anything exceptional. I have blockchain or Facebook found. I found a very basic problem, solved it, monetized it, sold it out. So what I did is can be done by any student of any college of the country. Not just DU, not just Ram, just not just Aryabhatta. Any normal college student can do what I have done. And I am very proud of it. Ki kuch extraordinary nahi hai. It's very simple. And I the motive of A circle is this only. To na, let people know that what we have done, you can also do that. And we have taken four years or three years, three and a half years to achieve that. And we are here to na, help you achieve the same things in the in 1.5 to 2 years. So that you decrease your time and you can achieve much more than what we have achieved in the past. Sir, so like you rightly said, anybody could have done the things that you did, but you were a pioneer. You were the first one to, uh, you know, identify a problem, think of a unique solution and right. you later monetized it, which is commendable in our opinion. 
सो भैया तुम लोग मेरी इतनी तारीफ करोगे तो मैं शर्मा आ जाऊंगा मैं कुछ बोल नहीं पाऊंगा really looking forward to this session and i'm i'm pretty sure we'll we'll all walk out of walk out of here as more insightful beings so we can definitely start with some questions kushi okay bhaiya aap ye batao pandemic kaisa tha aapke liye and aapke business ke liye kya ye ek challenging time tha ya fir aapko idhar se opportunities mili yaar very honestly i feel pandemic was necessary in everybody's life सबके लिए कुछ ना कुछ लाइफ लेसन थे देखो यार सिम, सबसे सिंपल बात अगर मैं अपने लिए लाइफ में एक साल निकालता तो मैं दुनिया से पीछे हो जाता एक साल अब मुझे उस एक साल को वेस्ट करते हुए ये फील नहीं होता कि सिर्फ मैंने वेस्ट किया पूरी दुनिया ने वेस्ट किया यार बहुत सिंपल लॉजिक अगर उन उन छह महीने साल मैंने कुछ नहीं किया तो किसी ने कुछ नहीं किया सो एवरीबडी गॉट द टाइम कहते ना डैट टाइम ऑफ वो उसको वो वेकेशन टाइम मिल गया हर आदमी को जो वो बहुत टाइम से ढूंढ रहा था पर ले नहीं पा रहा था क्योंकि उसको ये डर था वो बाकी लोगों से लाइफ में पीछे रह जाएगा तो मुझे पैंडमिक की जो पॉजिटिव बात लगती है वो ये लगती है कि भाई सबकी छुट्टी थी किसी ने लाइफ में कुछ खास अचीव नहीं करा एक्सेप्ट फॉर द टॉप फिफ्टी बिलियनर्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड उनकी नेटवर्थ बढ़ती गई लेकिन उनके नेटवर्क से हम लोगों को वैसे भी कोई मतलब नहीं था मुझे जो मतलब था तुम लोगों से था तुम लोगों को जो मतलब था मेरे से था और आपस के आस वाले लोगों से था द सर्कल वी लिव इन तो ये बहुत अच्छा था बाकी बिजनेस की बात रहे तो यार वी रिलीज द न्यूज इन सेप्टेम्बर बट आई सोल्ड माई कंपनी इन नवंबर टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन एंड वी वर बिजी विद द ट्रांसफर ऑफ द कम्प्लीट बिजनेस एंड द प्रॉपर्टीज वी हैड स्टूडेंट्स वी हैड एंड कहीं ना कहीं इट स्टॉप ड्यू टू पैंडमिक तो बिजनेस वॉज इफेक्टेड मनी केम इन लेट मनी स्टिल हैज इन केम इन फ्रॉम स्टैंड लिविंग ड्यू टू पैंडमिक प्रेस रिलीज वॉज लेट वी वर वेरी स्टक इन द करियर की कंपनी थी बेच दी पैसे नहीं आए अभी तक चीजें नहीं हो पा रही लेकिन टाइम मिला सोचने का क्या करना है अगर मैं ये बोलूं कि एकदम से पैसे आ जाते मेरे पास तो मे बी आई वुड हैव वेस्टेड द मनी दीज सिक्स मंथ्स ऑफ माय लाइफ गेव मी द थिंकिंग लेट हेल्प मी रियलाइज कि एक बार मैंने कुछ अचीव कर लिया लेकिन व्हेन आई एम स्टार्टिंग समथिंग अगेन इट इज सेम डिफिकल्ट फॉर मी और मे बी इट इज मोर डिफिकल्ट टू मी अगर इफ खुशी स्टार्ट समथिंग तो उस पर इतना प्रेशर नहीं है क्योंकि दिस इज द फर्स्ट टाइम खुशी इज स्टार्टिंग समथिंग बट इफ आई एम स्टार्टिंग समथिंग अगेन तो मेरे पे इतना ज्यादा प्रेशर है इस टाइम पूरी दुनिया का कि अगर मेरा सेकंड वेंचर फेल हो गया तो फर्स्ट वेंचर को दुनिया तुक्का बता देगी कि एक बार तुक्का लग गया इसका लग गया दोबारा नहीं चला तो प्रेशर बहुत ज्यादा था एंड आई ट्राई टू डू अ लॉट ऑफ सार्थ तो वॉज इन टच विद मी ड्यूरिंग दैंडमिक आई ट्राई टू डू कंसल्टिंग आई ट्राई टू डू एक आई ट्राई टू डू मार्केटिंग मैंने बहुत कुछ ट्राई किया फिर मुझे ये रियलाइज हुआ कि मुझे जब दोबारा से स्टार्ट करने में दिक्कत आ, आ रही है तो जो स्टूडेंट्स अभी पढ़ रहे हैं और जिन्हें करना है स्टार्ट उनको कितनी दिक्कत आ रही होगी तो वी स्टार्टेड ए सर्कल वेयर इन वी हेल्प पीपल अचीव देयर ड्रीम्स एंड जो स्टार्टअप आइडियाज हमारे पास थे हमने वही बच्चों को दे दिए जो मुझे लगा टैलेंटेड थे एंड वी स्टार्टेड दोज कंपनीज वी हैव अ प्लान टू इनकॉर्पोरेट टेन टू ट्वेंटी स्टार्टअप बाय द एंड ऑफ दिस ईयर एंड एटलीस्ट the the gross revenue of the, all the companies we incorporate for this year should be more than 25 crores. This is what we are aiming at for 2021. Okay, that is a very great aim, sir. Uh, the things that you are doing, these are, in my opinion, the need of the hour, and I'm sure that all our viewers feel the same way. And आपने जो pandemic के बारे में बताया, that is a very positive outlook, and I honestly, I'm very inspired by by that. But uh, At the same time, some of our viewers might not share a positive outlook. कुछ लोगों के दिमाग में negativity भी होगी तो उनके लिए आप क्या कहना चाहेंगे यार ये ना बहुत फेमस कोट है मैंने नहीं बोला लेकिन किसी बहुत बड़े आदमी ने बोला है अगर एक ग्लास आधा भरा हुआ है तो इट इज योर परस्पेक्टिव कि तुम उसको आधा खाली देखोगे या आधा भरा हुआ देखोगे एंड वट आई बिलीव इज कि देर इज अ पॉजिटिव एनर्जी अराउंड द यूनिवर्स वी लिव इन एंड इफ यू आर डूइंग एवरीथिंग कितना विद गुड इंटेंशन एंड ट्राइंग टू फोकस ऑन योर वर्क फुल टाइम तो दैट पॉजिटिव एनर्जी विल डेफिनेटली हेल्प यू एंड इसके साथ साथ यू हैव टू बी पॉजिटिव सी आई डोंट प्रीच प्री वो कहते हैं प्रीच स्पिरिचुअलिटी बट मेरा मानना ये है कि जब तक मैं सोचूंगा नहीं पॉजिटिव पॉजिटिव थिंकिंग नहीं होगी मेरी तब तक पॉजिटिव थिंग्स नहीं होंगी 
जब जब मेरे हर काम में मेरे को एक उसने भी बताया था एस्ट्रोलॉजर ने जब मेरे पूरी बॉडी में हर टाइम में नहीं 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 सोच रहा हूँ ना तो मैं यूनिवर्स की तरफ नेगेटिव एनर्जी फेंक रहा हूँ इफ आई एम थ्रोइंग नेगेटिव टू टूवर्ड्स समथिंग हाउ कैन आई एक्सपेक्ट इट टू थ्रो पॉजिटिव टूवर्ड्स मी कहते ना इफ आई एम गिविंग यू नेगेटिव वाई विल यू गिव मी पॉजिटिव अगर मैं यूनिवर्स को नेगेटिव दे रहा हूँ तो यूनिवर्स क्यों मुझे पॉजिटिव देगा तो आई बिलीव दैट वी शुड हैव अ पॉजिटिव आउटलुक टूवर्ड्स एवरीथिंग बाकी जिसको नेगेटिव सोचना भी है तो ये सोचो तुम्हारा कुछ अच्छा नहीं हुआ कोरोना में तो किसी का भी नहीं हुआ खत्म बात इफ आई डेंट डू एनीथिंग यू ऑल्सो डेंट डू एनीथिंग एंड ऑफ डिस्कशन ऑल एट द एंड ऑफ द डे वी ऑल आर रनिंग अर एट रेस कि मुझे इससे आगे निकलना है मुझे उससे आगे निकलना है मैं जितना मर्जी आगे ज्ञान दे लू इस बात पे कि हम रेड रेस में नहीं भागना ये नहीं करना वो नहीं करना पैसे के पीछे नहीं भागना पढ़ाई के पीछे नहीं भागना एट द एंड ऑफ द डे ऑल द इलेवन ऑफ यू अस एंड ऑल द फोर हंड्रेड पीपल और थ्री हंड्रेड पीपल वॉचिंग इट आर इन अ रेट रेस एंड वट मैटर्स टू अस इज कि इस रेट रेस में हमसे आगे कोई ना निकल जाए एंड कोरोना में वी कैन बी श्योर की कोई आगे नहीं निकला बस खत्म बात लुक टूवर्ड्स इट दिस वे This is my perspective. Baki yar, I cannot say any, anything about other people's perspective. That was really great, Baya. I hope all of the people who are watching this here imbibe this thought process. हम सब को एक positive outlook रखना चाहिए. We should be looking looking life from a very positive perspective. This is the only way to grow, I think. अच्छा, Baya, as we as you have also mentioned before, आपको हमेशा से एक businessman ही बनना था. मतलब You you are the person जो हमेशा कहता है बचपन में क्लासेस में कि मुझे बिजनेस मैन बनना है बड़े होके बट बहुत सारे हमारे दोस्त यहाँ पे ऐसे हैं देर आर मेनी पीपल हु हैव नो आइडिया वॉट दिल डू इन फ्यूचर सो जैसा आप जैसा यू राइटली से घर से निकल पड़ो रास्ता अपने आप मिल जाएगा अच्छी बहुत लगी हुई बट जैसे कि आपने कहा कि मतलब रास्ता मिल जाएगा घर से निकल पड़ो My question to you is कि मंजिल का पता मालूम कैसे होगा We have no idea of direction कि हमें जाना कहा है हम क्या ढूंढे How do we look for where do we need to reach? What's our destination? What's our destination? यार मतलब मेरे केस में I was sure of the destination. बाकी for other people I can say this एक बात बताओ अगर घर से निकलोगे ही नहीं तो कहीं पहुंचोगे ही नहीं Even if you don't know the destination, निकलो तो सही लेफ्ट जाओ राइट right जाओ चार लोगों से पूछो गूगल मैप चलाओ गूगल पे सर्च करो कहा जा सकते हैं क्या कर सकते हैं यूट्यूब देखो सब जगह हाथ पैर जब मारोगे कहीं तो पहुंचोगे ना अगर नहीं मारोगे हाथ पैर घर से नहीं निकलोगे तो तो घर में ही रह जाओगे समझ रहे हो वट आई एम ट्राइंग टू से इफ यू डोंट नो वेर यू वट यू वॉन्ट टू डू विफ एंड इफ यू आर नॉट ट्राइंग तो कुछ होना ही नहीं कुछ ट्राई करोगे लोगों से बात करोगे गूगल सी मेरे को अपने मैक्सिमम क्वेश्चंस के आंसर अपने सीए अपने लॉयर अपने भाई अपने पापा से नहीं मिलते मुझे मैक्सिमम क्वेश्चंस के आंसर मिलते हैं इस छह वर्ड की वेबसाइट से जी ओ ओ जी एल ई जिसपे ये इस टाइम पे गूगल मीट जैसे मीट भी चल रही है इस पे जाके तुम कुछ भी पूछोगे ये तुम्हें बताएगा और पैसे भी नहीं लेगा जब हमारे पास इतना अच्छा रिसोर्स है तो इसको हम वेस्ट क्यों जाने दे रहे हैं और अगर तुम्हें मंजिल नहीं पता यार मान लो तुझे नहीं पता तुझे यहाँ से निकल के मनाली पहुंचना है मैक्सिमम तुझे क्या करना है तुझे ऋषिकेश मनाली गोवा जयपुर जैसलमेर राजस्थान केरला कश्मीर पंजाब हरियाणा सब घूम के आना है ना उसके बाद तो तुझे पता चली जाएगा सब जगह पूरा इंडिया घूमा उसके बाद तुझे पता चल जाएगा तुझे कश्मीर जाना है लेकिन अगर तू घर में बैठा जाएगा ना तुझे पता चलेगा ना तू निकल पाएगा This was very insightful too. अब मैं अब तो मैं निकल जाऊंगा घर से आपने मोटिवेट कर दिया मुझे <laughs> और तो हिंदी में क्वेश्चन तो हिंदी में क्वेश्चन पूछ सकता है मेरे से मेरे को इंग्लिश ज्यादा पसंद नहीं है मुझे आती नहीं है यार भैया हमें भी नहीं आती हमने तो आपके लिए सीखी थी अरे यार फिर तुमने अच्छी रिसर्च फिर तुमने अच्छी रिसर्च नहीं करी मेरी तुमने कौन सी टॉक इंग्लिश में सुन ली मैं हिंदी में भी सुनी थी मैंने मैं, मैंने तो आईएसबी के लिए जो जीमैट एग्जाम दिया था उसमें भी चीटिंग करी थी मेरे फ्रेंड्स आज भी कहते हैं टेक्निकल ग्लिच था तेरे इंग्लिश नंबर कैसे आए ओके सर नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन है काफी पॉपुलर क्वेश्चन है और हमें पता है कि आपको इसके बारे में बात करना बहुत पसंद है 
तो बताइए कि कॉलेज सही टाइम है स्टार्टअप के लिए क्योंकि हम कॉलेज में हैं हम स्टूडेंट्स हैं हमें पता नहीं होता क्या करना है अगर पता भी होता है तो हम वेट कर रहे होते हैं हर चीज को परफेक्ट करने के लिए फिर हमारा टाइम निकल जाता है सो आप बोलिए इस क्वेश्चन का आंसर कुछ मैं नहीं दूंगा आप दोगे अच्छा एक बात बताओ कॉलेज में आपके पास ऑप्शन क्या क्या है करने के लिए आप क्या क्या कर सकते हो ये तो आप बता सकते हो ना मेरे को तो कॉलेज में आप भी थे आपने कैसे आइडेंटिफाई किया कि मुझे ये बिजनेस ही करना है यार देखो और बाकी लोग कैसे करें मैं बताता हूँ कॉलेज में वी हैव अलॉट ऑफ ऑप्शंस इधर वी जॉइन सोसाइटीज इधर वी गो फॉर इंटर्नशिप्स इधर वी प्रिपेयर फॉर एम बी इधर वी प्रिपेयर फॉर इधर वी डू अ स्टार्टअप मेरा मानना है अपनी कॉलेज लाइफ को तीन हिस्से में बांट लो पहली जिसमें तुम सोसाइटीज में भी पार्ट लोगे और इंटर्नशिप्स भी करोगे जितनी इंटर्नशिप्स करनी है सिर्फ फर्स्ट ईयर में करोगे सेकंड ईयर में कोई इंटर्नशिप नहीं करोगे फर्स्ट ईयर में जिससे जाके जो सीख सकते हो मार्केटिंग एचआर, ब्रांडिंग रिसर्च जितनी इंटर्नशिप ले सकते हो लाइक्स फेसबुक डाउनलोड सब ले लो फर्स्ट ईयर पूरा उस हिसाब से प्लान करो अपना सोसाइटीज में भी बेस्ट दूंगा इंटर्नशिप देखो पहली बात कॉलेज में पढ़ाई नहीं करनी टेन ईयर आती है तीन दिन में सारे एग्जाम निकल जाते मेरे भी निकले तो फर्स्ट ईयर को प्लान करो इंटर्नशिप्स एंड उस वे में पूरी सोसाइटीज में सेकेंड ईयर को प्लान करो सोसाइटीज में लीडरशिप पोजीशन लेनी है बिकॉज वी डोंट नो लेकिन जो ये लीडरशिप पोजीशन सोसाइटीज में होती है ना ये तुम्हें बहुत कुछ सिखाती है आज आज मैं जो भी चीजें करता हूं आई हैव लर्न द बेसिक्स ऑफ दीज थिंग्स वेन आई वॉज रनिंग सोसाइटीज इन माई कॉलेज कहते ना मेरे को स्टेज फेयर था स्टेज फेयर कैसे निकला आई यूज टू कहते ना ऑर्गेनाइज इवेंट्स इन कॉलेज जब लोगों के सामने बोलना स्टार्ट किया तो वो स्टेज फेयर निकल गया पहले आई वॉज वेरी एरोगेंट वेरी एरोगेंट मतलब आई मेरे को ऐसा लगता सनी गर्ग से बड़ा आदमी कोई है ही नहीं इस दुनिया में और जब मेरे पास कुछ नहीं था लाइफ में लिटरल अरे मेरे तो नाइनटी सिक्स परसेंट मार्क्स आए हैं मेरे से बड़ा कौन है मेरे, मेरे को तो इंडिया टॉप करना था आई वॉज वेरी एरोगेंट लेकिन वेन आई इंटरक्टेड विद पीपल इन सोसाइटी सबके नाइनटी सिक्स आए थे Apart from 96, what do you have, Mr. Senegar? Nothing. And जब तुम arrogant होते हो and you work in a society, you realize people start getting away from you. लोग तुम्हारे पास नहीं आते तुमसे बात करना नहीं चाहते and कहीं ना कहीं तुम्हारी वो arrogance जाने लगती है तो second year में society की leadership positions लो and you are not doing any internship this year. You are either preparing for an exam or doing your startup. And third year में फॉरगेट सोसाइटीज सोसाइटीज में कुछ करना ही नहीं है थर्ड ईयर में या तो स्टार्टअप पे फोकस करना है या एम बी ए पे फोकस करना है एंड यू हैव टू स्प्लिट टाइम ऐसा नहीं करना कि चार चीजें करनी है एक या दो चीज दो चीजें मैक्सिमम करनी है उससे ज्यादा नहीं करनी और थर्ड ईयर के एंड तक अगर तुमने दो साल किसी स्टार्टअप को दी है नो मैटर हाउ मच यू आर अर्निंग और हाउ मच यू आर डूइंग और यू आर वॉन्ट टू टेक इट आई हेड इन योर लाइफ एक चीज तो बहुत श्योर हो जाएगी कि तुम्हें बहुत कुछ करना आ जाएगा क्योंकि जिस दिन तुम स्टार्टअप करने का सोचोगे सबसे पहले तुम पार्टनर्स ढूंढोगे तो तुम्हें लोगों से बनानी आएगी उसके बाद तुम लोगो बनाओगे स्टार्टअप का तो तुम्हें ग्राफिक डिजाइनिंग सीखनी पड़ेगी उसके बाद तुम इंस्टाग्राम पेज चलाओगे तो तुम्हें इंस्टाग्राम मैनेजमेंट आएगी उसके बाद कोई ऑपरेशन होंगे स्टार्टअप में तो वो करोगे फिर टीम्स हायर करोगे तो हायरिंग आएगी फिर पूरा सब कुछ मैनेज करोगे तो मैनेजमेंट आएगी and when you will be experimenting all these things again and again pehle in during your internship then at society level and then at startup level to kahin na kahin na in teen saalon mein tumhe ye clear ho jayega ki tumhe kya karna hai jaise mujhe teen saal baad ye clear tha ki business to pata tha lekin business mein kya kya main operations karunga nahi kya main hiring karunga i cannot say no to people अभी इफ आई गेट आई गेट आई डोंट रिप्लाई बिकॉज मेरे से नो नहीं टाइप होता ये तो तुम्हारे वाले पे यस आया बिकॉज सार्थक को आई नो फॉर लास्ट वन ईयर वरना मेरे से नो नहीं होता एंड इफ आई वुड हैव डन एचआर तो मैं अपनी कंपनी में सबको हायर कर लेता और कंपनी के सारे बैंक बैलेंसेस एचआर में उड़ जाते तो एच आर नॉट मेंट फॉर मी इस सबको करते करते मुझे ये रियलाइज हुआ मुझे बेचना आता है और मुझे बेचने की स्ट्रैटेजीज बनानी आती है मार्केटिंग एंड सेल्स वॉज डिफाइंड फॉर मी कि भाई यू विल डू मार्केटिंग एंड सेल्स तुझे लोगों से बात करनी आती है उसके बाद लोगों से बात करनी आती है और तेरे को लोगों से काम कराना भी आता है तो सेकेंड वन आई गॉट वॉज लीडरशिप तो एट द एंड ऑफ थ्री ईयर्स नो मैटर मेरा कोई स्टार्टअप चला है या ना चला पैसे कमाए ना कमाए बट आई वॉज श्योर आई वॉन्टेड टू डू मार्केटिंग एंड सेल्स एंड लीडरशिप 
ये चीजें श्योर होने के बाद अब मुझे पता था कि मुझे आगे लाइफ में क्या करना है मुझे इन चीजों में जाना है बिजनेस करना है नहीं करना वो अलग बात है लेकिन अगर जॉब करनी है एम करनी है तो इस फील्ड में करनी है फिनेंस में नहीं करनी एच में नहीं करनी और एक एडवाइस और अब वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट कॉलेज तो एक क्वेश्चन और मेरे से लोग बहुत पूछते हैं कि व्हाट इज द राइट टाइम टू डू एन एमबीए तुमने पूछा ना कॉलेज में स्टार्टअप तो अगला क्वेश्चन तुम्हारा ये कहीं ना कहीं लिखा होगा कि तुमने आईएसबी क्यों ड्रॉप किया या व्हाट इज द राइट टाइम टू डू एन एमबीए मुझे इस क्वेश्चन में जो मुझे समझ में आता है इफ यूर मॉम हैंड यू आर ग्रोसरी लिस्ट कि भाई तुझे ये 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 लाना है ये नाइन का आएगा ये ले नाइन तुम ले आओगे तुम शॉर्ट 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 ले आओगे क्योंकि तुम्हें पता है मम्मी को उन चीजों की जरूरत है और तुम्हें इतने ही पैसे मिले हैं तुम कुछ फालतू का नहीं ले पाओगे बट अगर मैं मम्मी तुम्हें बोले कि तुम लो नाइन हंड्रेड रुपीज गो टू बिग बाजार गो टू बिग बाजार एंड तुम्हारा जो मन करे ग्रोसरी तुम वो ले आओगे बिग बाजार में क्या होता है कि हर हर जगह ना सेल लगी होती है बाय टू गेट टू इतना परसेंट डिस्काउंट इतना परसेंट डिस्काउंट शेल्फ स्पेसिस होते हैं कि ये शेल्फ स्पेस महंगा है तो यहाँ चीजें दिख रही हैं तो तुम्हें जहां डिस्काउंट लगेगा तुम भर लोगे और तुम्हारे नाइन हंड्रेड रुपीज खत्म हो जाएंगे क्यों क्योंकि तुम्हें ये नहीं पता था कि तुम्हें लेना क्या है सिमिलरली एम कॉलेज इज लाइक दैट ग्रोसरी स्टोर जहां पर बहुत सारी स्किल्स मिलने वाली है बहुत सारी नेटवर्किंग मिलने वाली है बहुत सारी अलग चीजें मिलने वाली है एंड यू आर दैट किड विद लिमिटेड रिसोर्सेज बिकॉज एम बी ए में दैट लिमिटेड रिसोर्स विल बी द टाइम तुम दस साल तक एम बी ए नहीं कर सकते तुम्हारे पास दो साल होंगे बस एम बी ए के लिए अगर तुम्हें पता ही नहीं है कि तुम्हें फाइनेंस में आगे जाना है और तुम मार्केटिंग क्लब ज्वाइन करके तुमने छह महीने खराब कर दिए अपनी एम बी ए के तो विल दैट एम बी ए मेक एन मेक सम सेंस तो कॉलेज के बाद एज सुन एज यू गोट फॉर एन एम बी ए यू विल बी दैट किड जिसके जेब में पैसे हैं और ग्रोसरी स्टोर में सेल लगी हुई है और ये सोसाइटी भी ले लेता हूँ ये भी कर लेता हूँ इस बच्चे से भी दोस्ती कर लेता हूँ ये लड़की भी अच्छी है इससे बात कर लेता हूँ अबे तुम्हारे टाइम तुम्हारे एम बी शेड्यूल में लड़की से बात करने का तो टाइम ही नहीं था तुम्हारे पास जो तुमने टाइम वेस्ट किया वो तुम्हें लीडरशिप लेसन लेने थे उसके बदले तो एम करने का राइट टाइम आई एम नॉट से इट इज इट आफ्टर कॉलेज और इज इट टू ईयर्स आफ्टर कॉलेज द राइट टाइम टू परस्यू यर एम बी ए इज नॉट वेन यू स्कोर नाइनटी इन यूर कैट The right time to do your MBA is when you are sure what you want to do with your life. कि मुझे marketing ही करनी है अब मैं marketing में ही जाऊंगा And ये चीज़ मैंने कैसे सीखी मेरे इतने सारे friends आए एस बी वाले जो दो साल बाद ज्वाइन करना था दो साल बाद ज्वाइन नहीं करा मैंने कहा क्यों नहीं करा अभी छः लाख मिल रहे हैं और अगर तुम एम बी ए की लास्ट सैलरी सोचोगे तो वो पचास लाख एक करोड़ रुपये हो गए तुम्हारा तो बैठे 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 पचास लाख का नुकसान हो गया क्योंकि एक साल तुमने एमबीए डिले कर दी लेकिन लेकिन वो वाली बात थी दे वांटेड टू बी श्योर दैट दे वांट टू परस्यू देयर मार्केटिंग एमबीए इसलिए उन्होंने एक साल फालतू लिया ताकि लाइफ के बचे हुए पैंतीस चालीस साल वो ये रिग्रेट ना करे कि मैंने एमबीए ही गलत सब्जेक्ट में कर लिया इसीलिए लोग चार चार डिग्रियां इसलिए परिणीति चोपड़ा के पास तीन डिग्री और तब भी वो एक्टिंग कर रही है उसको पता ही नहीं था क्या करना है जिंदगी में डिग्रियां लेती गई लेती गई लेती गई फिर समझ में आया मेरे को तो कैमरे के सामने बोलना है भैया मेरे परस्यू योर डिग्री भैया हम जब भी गूगल आपका नेम करते हैं हम जब भी लिखते हैं सनी गर्ग एंड तो जो सेकंड नेम आता है वो शिफाली जैन का आता है हाँ। तो भैया हमने कभी आपको उनके साथ कभी पब्लिक अपीरियंस में कभी नहीं देखा है सो so, आप प्लीज एक बार बता सकते हो कि आपके साथ साथ शिफाली दी का कितना बड़ा रोल रहा है यौशल में यार वैसे वो है तो इसी घर में लेकिन वो आएगी नहीं बिकॉज शी डजेंट लाइक पब्लिक अपीरियंसेस यस यार मेरी लाइफ योर शेल छोड़ मेरी लाइफ में या उसकी लाइफ में हम लोगों की लाइफ में ना एक दूसरे का बहुत बड़ा रोल है मतलब समझ रहे हो कि वी गाइज आर नॉट डेटिंग वेरी क्लियरली तुम अगला क्वेश्चन ये पूछो वी गाइज आर नॉट डेटिंग बट वी आर ईच अदर सपोर्ट सिस्टम तुम्हें लाइफ में ना कोई ना कोई एक आदमी चाहिए होता है जिसपे यू कैन ट्रस्ट जिसके साथ यू कैन कोऑर्डिनेट थिंग एंड शी इज दैट पर्सन और ज, मैं जाके पब्लिक अपीरेंस बो, बोलाता हूँ मैं जाके टॉक्स बोलाता हूँ मैं जाके ये बोलाता हूँ कि भाई एवरीबडी से सनी भैया सनी भैया मेरे पास मैसेजेस भी आ जाते हैं लोग मुझे जानते भी हैं लेकिन उसको कोई नहीं जानता बट अगर मैं यहाँ बैठ के कुछ बोल रहा हूँ तो क्या बोल रहा हूँ ये उसने डिसाइड करके भेजा हुआ मेरे को अगर मैंने जो स्टॉक्स में बोला ये 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 स्टोरी है तो वो स्टोरी लाइन फ्रेम करके मुझे शिफाली जैन ने दी थी कि हाँ जाके ये बोला यू तो वट एवर आई डू इट इज कहते ना फिफ्टी परसेंट क्रेडिट गोज टू हर एंड वट एवर शी डज फिफ्टी परसेंट क्रेडिट गोज टू मी तो वी आर इक्वल पार्टनर्स जो जिन्होंने रोल्स बहुत क्लियरली डिफाइन करे हुए हैं एंड हु आर नॉट जेलेस विद ईच अदर बिकॉ
कि भाई ये ये क्यों कर रहा है ये ये क्यों कर रहा है ये ये क्यों कर रहा है टचवुड हमारे यहाँ तो कभी ऐसी कोई दिक्कत नहीं हुई हम लोग का बहुत क्लियर था वरना शिफाली के पास डेली तीन या चार मैसेज इस बात के जरूर आते हैं ऑफ ऑफ ऑल दोज पीपल हु वॉन्ट अस टू फाइट कि आर वाई सनी गेटिंग फेमस एंड नॉट यू वाई आर यू नॉट गोइंग टू एन इवेंट अब सार्थक ने तो बुलाया दोनों को था उसने खुद ही नहीं आया बिकॉज शी डजेंट लाइक इट उसने बोला मेरे को पसंद नहीं है मेरे को जिस दिन जाना होगा मैं तेरे से ज्यादा इवेंट्स में चली जाऊंगी तो यू शुड बी कॉन्फिडेंट अबाउट यू एंड यू शुड बी कहते ना वेरी वेल यू शुड ट्रस्ट द अदर पर्सन इन द बिजनेस और इन द रिलेशनशिप Wow, that was no, amazing to hear. Uh, we all need a Shafali Jain in our life. Like we all need a Sunny. <laughs> let Bhai. let 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 me record this. At least, उसको पता तो होगा मैंने तारीफ करी थी उसकी. We all need a Shafali Jain in our lives. <laughs> And a Sunny. <laughs> we all need a Shafali Jain in our lives. ठीक है. Okay, thank you. अब बताओ. Uh. This was great, boy. Especially the analogy that you mentioned, ये grocery store वाली is something that I will remember for my life. I'm I'm very sure of. इसे जाके इसे जाके MBA के interview में दिया ना मैंने भी देखा आया था मेरा भी selection हो गया था. करेंगे तो जरूर देंगे आएंगे भैया. हाँ ये MBA के interview में दे देना बहुत पसंद आती है panel को. 400 viewers है ना सब लोग जाएंगे MBA के interview में ये. पता चला एक एक interview panel में चार लोग हैं चारों जाके grocery store बोल रहे हैं फिर वो panel वाला पूछ रहा है कहाँ से <laughs> हाँ तो वही ना आपकी वजह से सब नेक्स्ट जेन लीडर्स यहाँ पे हमारे व्यूअर्स सो थैंक यू फॉर दैट भैया बताओ और और पूछो क्या पूछना चाहते हो सो आई हैव द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन तो अनलाइक योर फैमिली टिपिकली जो जॉब ओरिएंटेड पेरेंट्स होते हैं दे आर नॉट वेरी सपोर्टिव ऑफ देयर चिल्ड्रन टू स्टार्टिंग ऑफ बिजनेस तो पेरेंट्स कहते हैं कि पढ़ाई करो अच्छे मार्क्स लेके आओ अच्छा सा कॉलेज लो टी जाओ स्पेशली देन अच्छी सी जॉब लो और इन सब के बीच आई बिलीव हमारी पर्सनल ग्रोथ कहीं ना कहीं रुक जाती है कॉम्प्रोमाइज होती है बहुत ज्यादा सो आप व्हाट वुड यू से टू दोस पेरेंट्स भाई आई डोंट हैव अ राइट टू से टू एनी पेरेंट अब मैं पेरेंटिंग लेसन नहीं दे सकता जब तक मेरे बच्चे कॉलेज में नहीं जाएंगे बट <laughs> हाँ ये बात मैं जरूर कहूंगा वट डू यू थिंक गौतम योर फादर नीड्स एट द एंड मतलब समझ रहे हो कि उनके लिए लाइफ में गौतम का क्या मैटर करता है गौतम की पढ़ाई गौतम की नौकरी या गौतम की खुशी एट द एंड ऑफ द डे वेल बीइंग मैटर्स द मोस्ट गौतम की खुशी कि गौतम खुश है लाइफ तो इफ यू आर डूइंग समथिंग दैट यू लाइक एंड यू आर एंजॉइंग इट नॉट इन वन मंथ सिक्स मंथ्स वन ईयर टू इयर्स फाइव इयर्स बट एट द एंड दे विल आल्सो बी हैप्पी मेरे घर वाले आज भी मुझे आज मैं सुबह घर गया था आज भी मुझे गाली पड़ी गया कि तू बिजनेस क्यों कर रहा है तू आई क्यों नहीं जा रहा क्यों आई एस भी नहीं जा रहा क्यों अच्छी नौकरी नहीं ले रहा क्यों वेल सेटल लाइफ नहीं ले रहा कि हफ्ते में पांच दिन काम करना होगा और बढ़िया सैटरडे संडे में फन करिए और महीने के एंड में दो लाख रुपए अकाउंट में क्रेडिट हो जाएंगे सैलरी बढ़ती जाएगी वाई नॉट दैट बट तुम्हारे पेरेंट्स का काम है तुम्हें डांटना नो मैटर हाउ गुड यू डू तुम्हारे भी डांटते हैं मेरे भी डांटते हैं अगर मम्मी का फोन आज भी आएगा अभी भी आएगा तो वो पूछेंगे तू फिर ज्ञान बांटने बैठ गया तुमने खाना खाया नहीं खाया कमाता धमाता तो कुछ है नहीं तो वो पेरेंट्स का लाइफ टाइम काम ये रहे, यही रहेगा बट एट द एंड व्हेन यू आर हैप्पी दे विल आल्सो बी हैप्पी लेकिन जिस दिन उन्होंने ये बोल दिया ना वी आर प्राउड ऑफ यू उस दिन के बाद तुम सर पे चढ़ जाओगे तो दे विल नेवर से दिस हाँ बट तुम तुम जब नहीं होंगे रूम में और, और लोग बैठे होंगे तो दे विल डेफिनेटली से दिस एट वी आर प्राउड ऑफ गौतम भैया ये पैंडेमिक नहीं होता ये ऑनलाइन नहीं होता तो अभी रूम में तालियां होती काफी यार आई पता है मेरे को ना आई वॉन्ट आई डू इवेंट्स फॉर फन मतलब मुझे मजा आता है जाके कि मुझे मेरा मेरी बात लोग सुन रहे हैं मैंने स्कूल में बोलने चाहिए कभी कोई सुनता नहीं था कॉलेज में इतनी बोलने चाहिए इतनी कोई सुनता नहीं अब मेरी लोग बात सुनते हैं तो मुझे मजा आता है बट ये ऑनलाइन में ना मुझे बिल्कुल सिस्टम नहीं पसंद आता कैमरे के सामने बैठो अपने आप से एक तो वो लोग जो ला बैठा देते ना कि स्क्रीन के सामने बैठ के एक घंटा बोलो मैंने कहा भाई नहीं ये नहीं हो पाएगा अगर स्क्रीन के सामने बोलना था शीशे के सामने बोलता ना अपनी मर्जी से गालियां भी देता बैठ के कम से कम के केस तो ना करता रिकॉर्डिंग करके <laughs> यहाँ पे तो कुछ मुंह से निकल गया तो दो मिनट में रिकॉर्ड करके कहोगे ये गाली दे रहा था पब्लिकली डिफेम करते भी रहेंगे लोग तो इसीलिए मुझे कॉलेज इवेंट्स लाइव बहुत पसंद है यू कैन इंटरेक्ट विद पीपल यू कैन इंटरेक्ट विद ऑडियंस वो ज्यादा फन होते हैं चांस टू है 
डेफिनेटली डेफिनेटली लाइव इवेंट्स के लिए नेवर से नू लाइव तो हम भी कॉलेज का भी लाइव इवेंट्स ओवर बिजनेस एनी डे सर व्हाई डोंट यू मेक दिस योर बिजनेस आप इतने अच्छे स्पीकर हैं टेड टॉक दे रखी है आपने यार और मतलब सी आई डोंट वांट टू मोनेटाइज दिस दिस इज व्हाट आई डू फॉर दिस इज व्हाट आई डू एज अ हॉबी दिस इज व्हाट आई डू फॉर फन तो मुझे ना इसके साथ ना पैसा टैग करना पसंद नहीं है वरना मेरे को ये मेरी पीआर टीम भी बहुत सलाह देती है कि आपका ये कर लो ये कर लो मैंने दो रील्स डाली है इंस्टाग्राम पे भी रिसेंटली क्योंकि मेरी जो मार्केटिंग वाली कंपनी है वो मेरे पीछे पड़ गए थे कि तू रील्स डालेगा और फिर तेरे फॉलोअर्स बढ़ जाएंगे फिर तू सेलिब्रिटी बन जाएगा तेरा ब्लू टिक लग जाएगा ये हो जाएगा वो हो जाएगा मैंने कहा फिर क्या तू मूवी में काम कराएगा मेरे से बनाएगा तो मुझे फिर भी प्रोड्यूसर वो तो मैं अभी बन जाऊंगा तो हीरो बनने की कोशिश क्यों करूँ अब आई डू इट फॉर फन मैं आई एम इफ आई टेक मनी फ्रॉम यू फॉर दिस आई विल बी कितना बाइंड बाउंडेड कि मेरे को ये बोलना है ऐसे बोलना है वो बोलना है अब मेरा मन करेगा मैं बोलूंगा मेरा मन नहीं मन करेगा मैं काट के कॉल चला जाऊंगा भाई आई डेंट चार्ज यू गाइज फॉर इट आई एम वेरी ऑब्लाइज दैट यू गाइज इन्वाइटेड मी आई एम वेरी ऑब्लाइज पीपल केम टू सी मी बट आई एम नॉट आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू बी बाउंडेड बाय समबडी कि यार ये ये नहीं करना ये करना है वो वो स्पीकर सेशन वाली चीज मेरे से नहीं और वो टैंट्रम्स मतलब आई रिमेंबर इन्वाइटिंग अ स्पीकर इन आर कॉलेज वेन आई वॉज इन ईसेल उसको उसने यस बोल दिया फिर उसके साइड से मेल आई कि मुझे इवेंट के बीच में बारह रेडबुल्स चाहिए होंगे कैब का आने का पैसा चाहिए होगा कैब का जाने का पैसा चाहिए होगा मेरी सेक्रेटरी के इतने पैसे चाहिए होंगे एक वीडियो रिकॉर्डिंग चाहिए होगी ये चाहिए होगा वो चाहिए होगा मैंने कहा भाई बिजनेस किस लिए कर रहे हो फिर इससे भी पैसे कमाने हैं तो अगर दस बच्चों से जाके मिल लोगे समझा दोगे उन्हें कुछ अच्छा तुम्हें किसी ने नहीं समझाया तो अगर तुम्हें किसी को समझाने का मौका मिल रहा है तो इससे बेटर तो कुछ है ही नहीं अगर मुझे किसी ने समझाया होता क्या पता मेरी मेरी लाइफ में तेईस की जगह इक्कीस साल में कुछ बढ़िया कर लेता या क्या पता किसी ने समझा दिया इसलिए तेईस में कर लिया वरना पच्चीस में होता और इस चीज के लिए मैं छोटा सा मॉनिटरी ट्रैक पांच दस हजार रुपए लेके क्या कर लूंगा इंटर्नशिप स्टाइपेंट थोड़ी है आपने समझा दिया हमें प्रॉब्लम हम भी कुछ जल्दी कर लेंगे और ओके सो भैया यू हैव बीन फीचर्ड इन फोर्ब्स एंड आपने इतनी 23 की एज में 20 करोड़ का बिजनेस एकदम खुद बिल्ड किया ऑफ कोर्स विद शफारी जैन असिस्टेंस बट इस टाइम पे हम लोग काफी डायरेक्शनल लेस है और यू नो एट दिस एज वेर ऑल लाइक इक्वली ओल्ड तो आपका इतना ब्रिमिंग सी वी है इतनी ज्यादा अचीवमेंट्स हैं हमें जानना है कि uh, हमें जानना है कि जो आपकी सीवी में नहीं है वॉट मेक्स यू एज ऑर्डनरी एज वी आर आई वोक एट वन और मे बी टू आई स्लीप एट सिक्स ए एम एंड आई एम नॉट वर्किंग वेन आई स्लीप एट सिक्स एम आई एम ऑल्सो वॉचिंग नेटफ्लिक्स फ्रॉम टू ए एम टू सिक्स सेवन ए एम आई एम ऑल्सो वॉचिंग नेटफ्लिक्स I woke, wake up at two. My office people come comes in the office at ten. I go to office every day at four. <laughs> This is what I do as a normal person, just like you guys do. And I also have normal friends. We also go to normal. तुम लोगों का favorite North Campus में या South Campus में cafe कौन सा है? Cafeteria and Kona. मैं भी cafeteria and Kona ही जाता हूँ. कैफेटेरियन को नहीं जाओगे तो बीवाईडी जाओगे मैं अभी बीवाईडी जाता हूँ मैं गुड़गांव शिफ्ट हो गया मैं कल तब भी कैफेटेरियन को गया था तुम लोग तुम लोग लोग लाइफ में सर आपने लाइफ पे रिवील कर दिया है अब सब लोग वहीं आ जाएंगे <laughs> तुम, तुम, तुम लोग तु, तुम लोगों को लाइफ में कभी ना कभी किसी लड़के या किसी लड़की ने रिजेक्ट किया होगा मेरे को भी करा है और आज आज भी बहुत बार ऐसा होता है कि मान लो मेरे कोई लड़की अब तो चलो सनी भैया वाली इमेज हो गई लेट्स गो बैक सिक्स मंथ वन ईयर और टू ईयर मैंने किसी लड़की को मैसेज किया मुझे भी रिप्लाई नहीं आया तो दिस इज वेरी ऑर्डिनरी कि मैंने मैसेज किया मैंने खुद फॉलो रिक्वेस्ट भेजी एक तो फॉलो बैक नहीं आया फिर 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 मैंने मैसेज किया मेरे पे रिप्लाई नहीं आया तो दिस इज एज ऑर्डिनरी एज यू गाइज आर तुम्हारे को तो फिर भी आ जाता होगा यू गाइज आर गर्ल्स तुम किसी लड़की को मैसेज करोगे रिप्लाई आएगा ही आएगा मेरे पास नहीं आता था भैया हम तो कॉलेज गए नहीं कभी मोस्ट ऑफ दिस पीपल आर सेकंड इयर्स बट जैसे मैं तो कभी कॉलेज गए नहीं एज इन कोई कैफे वैफे कुछ नहीं देखा सो वी आर जस्ट ईगरली वेटिंग फॉर द टाइम व्हेन कॉलेज इज ओपन एंड तुम लोगों का तो तुम लोग तुम लोगों का तो खराब सीन हो गया कोरोना की वजह से बिल्कुल अरे यार चलो यार लाइफ 
लाइफ हैज प्लान फॉर एवरीबडी समझ रहे हो ये सोचो कि तुम्हारे कॉलेज का एक साल मिस हो गया जिस जो जिसकी नौकरी गई बीस लाख पच्चीस लाख रुपए कमाता था उसका क्या हुआ या जो बिजनेस कर रहा था जिसका बिजनेस बर्बाद हो गया आई नो पीपल हैव गॉन बैंक करप्ट समझ रहे हो वेन एवर यू सी नेगेटिव इन योर लाइफ सी पीपल हु आर गोइंग थ्रू मोर नेगेटिव अब तुम सोचो तुम्हारे कॉलेज का एक साल बर्बाद हुआ तुम कैफे नहीं जा पाए मैं तुम्हें ऐसे दस एग्जाम्पल गिराता हूँ जिनका दस दस बीस बीस करोड़ रुपए का नुकसान हुआ हुआ है और लिटरल ऐसी कगार में कि कभी भी छत से कूद जाएंगे यू आर बेटर ऑफ इन योर लाइफ नो कॉलेज तो एक साल बाद चल जाना थर्ड ईयर में ग्रेजुएट होने के बाद एक साल बाहर बाबा बन के बैठ जाना लेक्चर लड़वा लेना कॉलेज में एक साल फाल तो काट लेना कॉलेज में कौन मना कर रहा है और बताओ कोई ऑडियंस रिलेटेड क्वेश्चन उठा लो किसी को जो क्वेश्चन अगर कोई रिपीट हो रहा है वैसे एक पर्सनल क्वेश्चन है मेरा मतलब आई वांटेड टू आस्क बिकॉज़ मैं पर्सनली एक्सपीरियंस कर रहा हूं ये सो आई वांटेड टू स्टार्ट अप विद समथिंग आई हैड आई हैड सम प्लान्स इन माय माइंड फॉर रिलेटेड टू कंटेंट क्रिएशन बट मतलब मैंने एक्सपीरियंस किया इट्स इट हैज बीन हैपनिंग सिंस लॉकडाउन कि जब तक मैं उन चीजों में परफेक्ट नहीं हो जाता अनलेस आई कम कम अप विद द परफेक्ट परफेक्ट कंटेंट और इन एनी बिजनेस पीपल अनलेस दे कम अप विद द परफेक्ट प्रोडक्ट सो वो लॉन्च नहीं करते दे डोंट गेट स्टार्टेड नो तो फिर आई एम स्टिल हंग अप ऑन द फैक्ट कि मतलब आई एम नॉट द आई हैड आई डोंट हैव द परफेक्ट कंटेंट विद मी टू स्टार्ट पोस्टिंग सो शुड आई जस्ट गेट स्टार्टेड विद व्हाटएवर आई हैव एंड लर्न ऑन द वे एंड और आई आई शुड गेट परफेक्ट फर्स्ट इफ यू हैव लिसन टू माय टॉक्स द फर्स्ट बिजनेस डील आई डिड इन माय लाइफ वाज 2000 रुपए में 1000 लाइक्स इफ यू हैव heard it any any video कि दो हजार रुपए में हजार लाइक्स अगर मैं उस टाइम पे ये सोचता कि जिस दिन मुझे दस करोड़ की डील करनी आ जाएगी मैं उसी दिन डील करनी स्टार्ट करूंगा तो कभी दस करोड़ की डील ना होती कहीं से तो स्टार्ट करना पड़ेगा तभी तो चीजें आएंगी चीजें पता है मैं बताता हूँ ऑन्टरप्रन्योरशिप हो या फिर परफेक्शन हो एक तो पहली बात परफेक्शन इज द एनिमी ऑफ ऑन्टरप्रन्योरशिप दिस इज वट वी प्रीच एट ई If you are going for perfection, you will never be able to do entrepreneurship. दूसरा जो ये है क्या बोलते हैं uh, अगर तुम ये सोचते रहोगे कि मैं परफेक्ट करूंगा परफेक्ट करूंगा परफेक्ट करूंगा तो कभी नहीं कर पाओगे बिकॉज परफेक्शन कम्स फ्रॉम एक्सपीरियंस नेगेटिव एक्सपीरियंसिस एंड नेगेटिव एक्सपीरियंसिस कम्स फ्रॉम एक्सपीरियंसिस जब तक तुम एक्सपीरियंस नहीं लोगे कोई चीज तो वो गलत नहीं होगी अगर गलत नहीं होगी तो तुम्हें सही तरीका नहीं पता होगा करने का और सही तरीका नहीं पता होगा तो परफेक्ट कैसे करोगे समझ रहे हो मतलब यू विल हैव टू स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द नेगेटिव इन्फिनिटी टू गो टूवर्ड्स पॉजिटिव इन्फिनिटी ऑन द नंबर लाइन सिस्टम यूज टू स्टडी इन मैथमेटिक्स डायरेक्ट यहां से कोई स्टार्ट नहीं करता जो यहां से करता है जो मर्जी कर कुछ भी वायरल हो जाता है रसोड़े में कौन था यशराज मुखाते का वो वायरल हो गया और उसका करियर नेक्स्ट लेवल बन गया पता नहीं कितने कितने लाख रुपए मांगे डालेंगे और क्या बनाया था उसने राशि बहन का रसोड़े में कौन था मेरी मम्मी बैठ के वो सीरियल देखती थी वो इतना इरिटेटिंग सीरियल सोशल मीडिया पे तो छोड़ मुझे लगता था वो अंटियों के बीच में भी वायरल नहीं हुआ कभी यशराज में कौन था और उसको पता था कि उसमें मिलियन व्यूज आएंगे You you don't know what what will get viral and and this is you have to go out find work and if you don't find work if don't ATM hey, anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> उन सारे सेशन किए को इतना ही मक्खन तो वैसे वैसे चाहिए क्या मेरे से अरे नहीं ये सच में रिलेटिवल है हमारे लिए मतलब मैं 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 स्पॉन्सर नहीं करता for our different companies you can apply to work with us at bit.ly/work at a okay.
for our different companies you can apply to work with us at bit.ly slash work at a you can find that link on our instagram page a dot circle sir kali visit kiya tha humne wo jab hum research kar rahe the so uh, you can find uh, brings us to the next like ek support group shefali jain aur aapke kuch aur friends to uh, workplace environment kafi uh, informal aajkal ek op- उस पे क्या व्यूज है कि अगर फ्रेंडली रिलेशंस हो वर्क प्लेस एनवायरमेंट में दिस इज वन टॉपिक आई एंड शेफाली डिबेट अ लॉट ऑफ टाइम्स मतलब आई एम अ वेरी फ्रेंडली कैन नॉट गेट प्रोफेशनल अगर तुम मुझे थ्री पीस सूट पहनाओगे मैं तब भी जाके बक्सू दिख जाऊंगा एंड इवन इफ शी कम्स इन टी शर्ट शी इज वेरी प्रोफेशनल तो दिस इज a difference and kahin na kahin na there should be a mix of both when it is needed professional should be there and when it is needed okay na personal should be there to hamare mein it is very clear ki agar kisi ko personal touch chahiye he comes to me agar kisi ko professional gali sunni hai to she he or she goes to shefali so it is very clear ki bhai agar kisi ko gali bakni hai to wo bakegi hi agar kisi ko pyar se samjhana hai to main samjha dunga aapko sometimes we do interchange our roles but kehte na to bring things to equilibrium jo economics mein padhate the ki supply aur demand ka equilibrium hona chahiye waise hi personal and professional ka equilibrium hona chahiye because if you go super professional to tumhare mein aur germany ke nazi mein koi farak nahi raha hitler mein tum bhi gas chamber mein dal ke maarte dikhoge logo mein and agar you are going very friendly which we we have tried in the past to log tumhe gas chamber mein dal ke maar denge tumhare employees because people do exploit you अभी वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट समथिंग बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द लाइफ दैट इज वन केस ऑफ मी बीइंग ओवर फ्रेंडली बी मी बीइंग ओवर नाइस कि मैं तो यार ऐसे ही यार चलो ठीक है यार ये 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 और उसी के बाद चक्कर में मेरे को वो कर दिया गया कि भाई अब हमें भी दिया जाए सर नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन सो बाय दिस पॉइंट यू must have addressed so many thousands of students aapne bola ki aapko live events karna bahut pasand hai itne sare colleges mein gaye hu but ek bar aapne pehli bar bhi students ko address kiya hoga uske bare mein aap bata sakte hain aapko kaisa laga aap nervous the yaar main batata hu kya tha i had a lot of stage fear i still do matlab even before joining your live main i always come late क्योंकि पांच मिनट तो मेरे से प्रेशर हैंडल नहीं होता यार व्हाट विल आई स्पीक विल पीपल लाइक माय अनप्रोफेशनलिज्म विल पीपल नॉट टेक इट कि यार ये क्या किसको बुला ला ये लोग तो ही सम काइंड ऑफ फ्रॉड लाइक माय क्रॉस इन सूट्स की ये इसके बाद डिग्री विग्री कुछ नहीं है इसके बाद कुछ नहीं है ये आके बस हवाबाजी करके चला जाएगा तो उस टाइम पे आई डेंट कहते ना आई डेंट थिंक ऑफ कि मेरे पे इतनी जल्दी ऑफर आएगा वाई वॉज स्टिल इन कॉलेज तो देर वॉज दिस टीचर हु गॉट ट्रांसफर टू अ गर्ल्स कॉलेज so bharat bharati college and she invited me there ki we have this tuesday sessions and every tuesday we invite some uh, person to our college and he or uh, he or she speaks about his journey in life so trust me i spoke the for the very first time in front of a girls all girls crowd 125 girls sitting there and i didn't know what to speak i was not prepared because when you think of speaking at a stage or addressing the audience you are like english mein bolna padega aise bolna padega ye bolna padega this is because this is what we have been taught always ki koi speaker aayega to wo 10 interesting ya 10 bookish concepts batayega english bolega bahut zyada style marega attitude dikhayega and i didn't have all of that us time pe bhi and i thought ki yaar log sochenge kuch nahi karta life mein isko aise utha ke le aaye and i tried to speak in english but when i spoke my first word it was comp- the same way i speak right now ki bhai main to aise hi bol diya ki bhai ye ye hua ye ye hua aise ho gaya aise ho gaya aise ho gaya and people liked the story my teacher said ki whenever there are people who are coming for the session the audience decreases and reduces to 75% or 50% till the ten- end of the session this is the first time that all the 125 girls were sitting throughout the whole tenure because they find they they found your journey relatable 
and that is where it clicked to me that i have to keep it as relatable as possible i don't have to speak it like a speaker i have to speak it like i am one of you so that you can see because my thought here is not to give you concepts that you can find that concepts you can find in youtube videos that concepts you can find in google anywhere my concept of taking all these sessions is to make you believe that i am also one of you which is very true i am i was a du student i was a du student 3 years back and i also was organizing the same events you are doing right now so my motive is never to kitna give concepts or give lectures it is always to ignite that fire ki ye kar sakta hai to main kyun nahi kar sakta jab ye baithe hue ye bakchod aadmi ye sab kar sakta hai to main kyun nahi kar sakta main to isse better hu mere ko english bolni bhi aati hai mere ko ye karna bhi aata hai to that is why i keep it very raw very candid and very relatable well we are all fans of mike cross by the way <laughs> <laughs> I I have watched I have I have watched it three times. काफी dedication चाहिए फिर उसके लिए तो अच्छा just so, one um, question I have for you how how and where did you get the name Sunny भैया ये कहाँ से popular हुआ Sunny भैया बोलना यार देखो Sunny भैया obviously कोई लड़का ये नहीं चाहेगा कि लड़कियों से Sunny भैया बोले मतलब समझो I am also single. I am also a guy who has aspirations in life, personal lives also, personal life also. But the thing was, I was running girls' hostels, and it was a very responsible job. मतलब समझ रहे हो job profile of running a girls' hostel was very scary. मतलब my mom was very happy when I sold the company because उसने उनको लगता था कि जिन कोई लड़की को कुछ हो गया तो you will be held responsible. And कहीं ना कहीं ना it was very फियरफुल फॉर मी ऑल्सो क्योंकि हम लोगों के 600 सौ बेड से सिक्स हंड्रेड में से फोर हंड्रेड फिफ्टी वर गर्ल्स एंड इट इज वेरी स्केरी कि कोई भी लड़की कुछ भी यू डोंट नो हाउ द अदर पर्सन इज एंड एंड मेरे को ना सनी सर नहीं बुलवाना था बिकॉज तुम पी जी वाले को अगर सनी बोलोगे तो यू विल फील ऑकवर्ड यू विल मेक गेट फ्रेंड विद एम तो चिल्ड्रन यूज टू कॉल मी सनी सर तो मुझे सनी सर ऐसा लगता है यार सनी तेरे बाल भी सफेद होने वाले हैं अब दो चार साल में तेरे बच्चे बच्चे बड़े होने वाले हैं सनी सर बन गया अब तू या तो तू कॉलेज वॉलेज में पढ़ाना स्टार्ट कर दे या किसी कंपनी में जाकर बढ़िया नौकरी वोकरी कर ले ये क्या कर रहा है तो मैंने बहुत समझाया लोगों की मुझे सनी बोलो मुझे सनी बोलो बट एवरीबडी स्टार्टेड कॉलिंग में सनी भैया तो इट स्टार्टेड फ्रॉम योर कॉलेज टाइम जूनियर सीनियर्स को भैया ही बोलते हैं डी में जितना आई है हर्ड फिर वो योर शेल में फिर द स्टाफ ऑल दो दे आर मच एल्डर टू मी बट अब वो सनी नहीं बोल सकते बिकॉज कहीं ना कहीं उनका कहना है वी रिस्पेक्ट यू और सर बोलना गार्ड्स वार्डन को इन लोगों को आता नहीं तो उनको तो दिखता था सनी भैया तो कहीं ना कहीं ना ये पूरा वो हो गया कि एवरीबडी स्टार्टेड कॉलिंग मी सनी भैया एंड आई आफ्टर देख शुरू में आई वॉज वेरी फ्रस्ट्रेटेड बिकॉज वेन आई वॉज इन कॉलेज आई वॉज ऑल्सो लाइक अ नॉर्मल गाय फ्लर्टिंग विद गर्ल्स टेक्सटिंग दे ऑन इंस्टाग्राम गोइंग आउट ऑन डेट्स बट वेन आई स्टार्टेड योर शेल तो आई आई वॉज कितना बिठा के समझाया गया था कि अगर तू किसी लड़की के साथ घूमता हुआ पाया गया तो पूरे कैंपस में ये बात उड़ेगी कि ये पीजी का ओनर अच्छा नहीं है तो मेरे को अपनी पर्सनल लाइफ को कंट्रोल करना बहुत जरूरत है एंड व्हेन व्हेन दिस भैया थिंग केम इन द स्टार्टिंग आई वाज वेरी यार ये क्यों बोल रहे हैं बट फिर धीरे धीरे समझ में आ गया दैट सनी यू विल हैव टू लेट गो योर पर्सनल लाइफ फॉर योर प्रोफेशनल लाइफ एंड आई एम क्वाइट हैप्पी अबाउट इट नाउ मतलब अब कोई मुझे भैया नहीं बोलता तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है क्यों बे तेरा छोटा भाई थोड़ी हूँ मैं जैसे सनी बोल रहा है मतलब दिस इज माई ऑनेस्ट फीलिंग बिकॉज इतना सनी अब अब बहुत बार ना ऐसा होता है कि वेन आई गो होम एंड आई कोई मुझे सनी बोलता है तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है अरे तेरा नाम तो सनी है सनी भैया नहीं है बिकॉज आई हैव लिटरली सीन माई नेम सेव्ड एज सनी भैया गर्ग योर शेल सनी भैया गर्ग सनी भैया योर शेल आई हैवेंट सीन माई नेम सेव्ड एज सनी इन समबडीज फोन फॉर अ वेरी लॉन्ग टाइम नाउ Parash Shefali also used to call me Sunny Bhaiya in college. Now this clears a lot of uh, misconception. क्यों मेरी बात का विश्वास नहीं हो रहा था तुम्हें? नहीं मैंने तो मान ली थी. क्या पता सबने हमारे मुझे भी दे देना भैया ना Sunny Bhaiya save कर लूँगा. अरे यार ले लियो कोई दिक्कत नहीं. साथ साथ के पास मेरे सारे नंबर हैं. Personal भी professional भी. हम्म बताओ. Okay next question. Uh... सनी भैया आपकी लाइफ 
हमारे लिए एटलीस्ट मेरे लिए तो काफी ज्यादा इंस्पायरिंग काफी रिलेटेबल एंड वन डे आई होप टू यू नो बी एज ऑथेंटिक एंड अचीव एज मच विद वाइल बींग सो कैंडेड आई होप टू डू दैट बट आप बता सकते हैं कि ऐसा कुछ है जो आप ऑल्टर करना चाहेंगे अपनी लाइफ में इफ यू कुड गो बैक एंड चेंज समथिंग Here I cannot speak about those things publicly. Okay. Lab, sure, see, yeah. very honest, <laughs> see very, very honestly speaking, there are some things which I cannot speak publicly. मतलब समझ रहे हो? There are regrets in my life, and there are things I always talk about positive things because I don't want you guys to, you know, think that things are difficult, but things are not as easy as I show them. there were times i didn't have money to even buy somebody a drink and drinks i mean 12 rupees ki cold drink and this was a time when i was running your shell to paise ki bhi dikkat hui hai there were times i had to work for 7 days straight just sleeping 2 hours a day there were times when i was surrounded by 200 parents shouting at me because their properties were not ready there were times i was sat down In a circle by a lot of girls, and they all were shouting, "I can't eat good food. Wi-Fi doesn't work. Laundry doesn't come. This doesn't come. That doesn't come." There are things that are currently going in my life, and I cannot talk about them publicly, and which are giving me a lot of tensions and stress. But my concept is very clear. You have very limited time on this planet, and if you start thinking about the negative things of life, that time meter is not going to. और वो तो खत्म होगा ही होगा तो लुक टुवर्ड्स द पॉजिटिव पार्ट बट जस्ट टेलिंग यू इट इज नॉट एज इजी थोड़ा टाइम मेहनत लगती है एंड यू विल हैव टू डू दैट एंड मेहनत करने में मजा भी आता है राइट सर वी एग्री लाइक हर किसी की लाइफ में ऐसा होता है एंड आई गेस हमने बहुत सारे क्वेश्चंस आपसे पूछ लिए हैं राइट सो आई गेस दैट्स द एंड ऑफ इट एंड वी आर रियली ग्रेटफुल आई थिंक खुशी और गौतम को बहुत मजा आया आपसे बात करके एंड इट वाज रियली गुड रियली इंस्पायरिंग एंड थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच गाइस फॉर थैंक यू सो मच गाइस फॉर इनवाइटिंग इनवाइटिंग मी एंड जॉइनिंग इन एंड लिसनिंग टू मी एक घंटे के लिए मेरी बकवास कितने लोगों ने सुनी 300 400 कितने ने सुनी ओवर 10000 ओवर 1000 पीपल आर लिसनिंग चलो थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीबॉडी फॉर कमिंग You can you can get in touch me with me. देखो नंबर नहीं दूंगा वो लोग फोन कर करके परेशान करते हैं तुम लोग ले लेना एफ आई सी आर भट्ट वाले पर जो और भी ऑडियंस है लोग परेशान कर देते हैं कि हमारा ये आइडिया फंड कर दो यू कैन कॉन्टैक्ट मी ओवर लिंकड इन इट्स सनी गर्ग ओनली तुम सनी गर्ग यही सर्कल लिखोगे तुम्हें मिल जाएगा सनी गर्ग और शल लिखोगे गूगल पे तब भी तुम्हें मेरा लिंकड इन मिल जाएगा इफ यू वॉन्ट टू सर्च ऑन इंस्टाग्राम इट्स सिंपल सनी भैया ठीक है थैंक यू सो मच गाइज यार It so was much. fun and interacting. Thank you so much, Priya. Same here. Thank you. Okay. Okay, guys. So now we'll be back in a minute with next speaker. So stay, uh, stay tuned.
Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for staying tuned with us till now. The evening is not yet over. We have with us the last speaker of the day, the very renowned and insightful Mr. Sharad Vivek Sagar. Mr. Sagar is an Indian social entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Dexterity Global. He is enlisted in the 2016 Forbes 30 under 30 list and uh, as a social entrepreneur. He is also the only Indian national to be invited to the White House by the US President Mr. Barack Obama as part of the conference of young entrepreneurs all over the world. He is also the expert for the famous television show Kaun Banega Karorpati. We are really glad and humbled to have you, sir. Now I would hand over the mic to sir so he can share his wisdom and insight with all of us. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the students of Aribhatta College uh, for organizing something this great and this beautiful. And uh, thank you to everybody who is uh, watching or listening through whatever platform you are at this point in time. Uh, it's been a kind introduction already. I will not take much of your time. I'm supposed to make my remarks in the first 15 to 20 minutes and then take questions uh, from your fellow students. So I shall do exactly that as a servant of the stage. Now, I think it is phenomenal, the work that uh, you are doing uh, through this platform. I just want to share a little bit about leadership in general. Uh, many of you will go on to be finance guys and business guys. Many of you will hopefully will enter politics. Some of you will write policies. Many of you will be in the field of economics or start a company of your own. And of course, some of you will try to save the world by becoming social entrepreneurs. But importantly, it is important to keep the idea of leadership very clear in your mind, uh, wherever you are. And that is uh, an idea that I have had the great honor of working on uh, in the last 12 years straight uh, through the organization that I lead uh, called Dexterity Global. Now, Dexterity Global's introduction to many of you, it might be that uh, Dexterity has connected uh, several lakh students in our country with educational opportunities on the 10th of every month, uh, because we believe that if there is an opportunity for our children and youth, they should be the first ones to know about it. Uh, the other introduction that many people do have about Dexterity is that we built local role models and many of these children have gone on to receive more than 51 crores in scholarships from some of the topmost universities across the world. Uh, now, because of this and the kind of track record I had in my high school life and in my college life, and uh, many people feel that I can speak decent Hindi and decent English, so they invite me to speak all across the country. I have done that happily in last three, four years, and in February I stopped once Corona uh, came over, but thankfully I'm still doing a few digital speeches. Now, in my speeches across the country, parents and teachers, uh, many people in, who are members of the audience, they very curi uh, with great curiosity, they ask me that everything is good. You are, you know, preparing good students and they are receiving scholarships and they are uh, getting to know about educational opportunities. Why do you talk about leadership? Because uh, Dexterity's mission statement says that Dexterity Global is a national organization that is on the mission to power the next generation of leaders. Now, many people ask that question, why do you talk about leadership? We want our children to become doctors, engineers, journalists, artists, historians. We don't want them to become leaders. And that is something that through your platform, as I have at many other platforms, I want to highlight that the most unfortunate thing that can happen in a country is when education and leadership become separate, when the bridge between the two falls, when there is a gap between both. And that is exactly what does exist in our country. Many times as bright, young, hardworking students, you are oftentimes told that leaders are those who you see on primetime television and that your education will land you a nine to five job. That that nine to five job may not be a part of nation building. That you may not contribute actively. And many of us make peace with this and we pick our own tracks. We become more self-centered, start moving, being very protective about our transcripts, about our paychecks, about our career prospects, because it becomes a lonely world when you separate yourself from the society and from the nation, especially because you don't feel that you have a contribution to make in nation building. Nobody tells you that that great generation of leadership that got us freedom, each one of them, whether it was Sardar Patel, Mahatma Gandhi, B.R. Ambedkar, Pandit Nehru, we told you what they were doing when they were 50 or when they were 60. We never told you what were they doing when they were 15 or 16. 
when they were in their late teens or early 20s mahatma gandhi was at a place called university college in london pandit nehru went to a place called middle temple college b r ambedkar secured a full scholarship from maharaja sahib rao gaikwad of baroda and studied at columbia university pandit nehru went to cambridge this was the education for that generation that has been linked in terms of gandhi with a walking stick nehru with a rose sardar patel with an iron b r ambedkar with poverty we forgot to tell our young generation that these leaders were built solely by their education but an education that was not limited just to books but that also found meaning through communication that is samvad that continuous dialogue with people around you those who cared those who were in pain those who could offer solutions that continuous dialogue was a mandatory and important and crucial part of their life the second part was seva how could their education how could their knowledge their information their abilities their dexterity for that matter transform to offer some level of seva to people and that is exactly how so many people in this country no matter where they were educated whether well within our national boundaries or in foreign shores they began to put their education to use and that is something extremely important what we have forgotten to tell our children in our country is that it is those who put their head down and work hard on their study table because of them we raise our heads and call ourselves proud indians let me quickly walk you through a few examples that begins to tell you that your education at aryabhatta college matters that as young citizens your journey will have a transformative and fundamental impact on the india of 2035 or 2045 it was in this country when we used to debate that what would happen if china tries to encroach upon if america tries to bully if pakistan tries to attack and in the education of a young child from rameshwaram we go on to find not just scientific leadership that would give us internal security but also statesmanship that would give us a moral compass president kalam's education had transformative leadership impact on this country through science and through statesmanship in this country when we gained freedom a young graduate returned from university of cambridge and tried to convince the prime minister and his cabinet that space was not just the forte of america and russia that india could also conquer outer space and it is because of vikram sarabhai a young fresh graduate from university of cambridge that india became the space power that it has today we launch spacecrafts for a smaller budget than american like the western countries launch movies for on the same issue in this country a young graduate returns from michigan state university studying dairy technology in 1948 leaving the united states of america goes to the sleepy town of anand in gujarat works under the apprenticeship of somebody named tribhuvan das patel and together in 50 years time in 1998 right here in this country that brand that you see on the front of the cricketing jerseys of south africa and netherlands Amul makes India the largest producer of milk a white revolution is heralded right here at home and we overtook the same united states of america that vergis kurian had left and returned to india in order to become the largest producer of milk in the world from a milk deficient country we became the largest producers in this country we talked about public transport and infrastructure and it was in the education of a 30 year old civil engineer e shridharan that we connected rameshwaram to mainland india again when pamban bridge bridge fell down that we built that most challenging railway line in the world the konkan railways cutting through tunnels and clearing forests and acquiring land and making sure we can still deliver that public transport but e shridharan sir e shridharan did not just stop that he delivered to this country what is india's pride and the world's envy the delhi metro and then so many metros after that why do i talk about kalam shridharan kurian uh, and all these great legends because india has fundamentally been lifted up more people have been fed more people have been fed, more people have been better educated and more people have lived a quality life because of the education to continue through our schools and colleges but so many times we forget while teaching our kids in school and college to ever ask them or tell them why do we send a generation to school and why do we send them to college 
And unfortunately, the answer for that reason finds a bridge between a college transcript and a paycheck and forgets that bridge between education and leadership, between self and nation building. And that is something that each one of us. So what has been my contribution in that journey? For the first 12 years of life, I lived in small towns and villages of Bihar, far from schools or libraries. Studying at home, reading 12, I moved to the capital city of Bihar, the city of Patna that would become my hometown with my mother. And I get enrolled in a school. I start participating in every of these years from the international competitions and represented India in over six different countries. Now, I could have been one of those selfish guys who looked at self, patted himself on the back and said, I am doing this because I'm smart, hardworking, and, you know, driven. But I saw something important when I used to come back from Japan or South Korea or Bangladesh, America, wherever I was representing India, I would come back, I would tell my friends about the questions that were asked, the ideas that were put forward, the hotel where we stayed, the flights that we took. And many a times, I used to see that my friend, my classroom, international schools or world schools, where the school fee sometimes is more than the salary of a middle class father and mother put together. And I used to wonder if we are talking about access to clean drinking water, would the world not be better served if a girl child from a village in Rajasthan who has seen her mother go a kilometer and a half to fetch drinking water for the family, if her lived experiences, if her you know, inspiration and if her creative solutions would sound so much better at these global platforms than those who are Googling and finding out about the problem. I felt that her presence in itself would be such a powerful thing. Her lived experiences would pave the path toward creative solutions and tomorrow we would build leadership so that we do not have to parachute leadership from Massachusetts to Mumbai. We do not have to parachute leadership from Mumbai to Muzaffarpur. We have gotten in this habit where leadership comes from outside. It is parachuted from a bigger place to a smaller place. And we are happier when that happens. So the second part of dexterity thought was that we need to build leadership within communities that have it the least but need it the most. That we need to build local role models. That while I might have started with President Kalam's example or Vikram Sarabhai's example, or you can talk about Sachin Tendulkar, but for many of our young boys and girls in small towns and villages of Bihar or India, for them, these role models are still one in a billion. They need to see that first girl child from the village who goes to college on a full scholarship. They need to see that first boy child from the village who starts a company of his own. They need to see that first kid from that particular district who wins for India at an international platform. So these local role models we set out to build. In the last 12 years, I have had the greatest honor and privilege of working with young men and women from different parts of our country and shape them as future leaders in science, in policy, in art, in whichever field they are interested in. Because this nation needs leadership and that leadership must come from education. So as I tell the story of dexterity, I hope I also make that appeal to you that whatever you are interested in, your job is to contribute to public service. Your job is to contribute to nation building. That sitting right where you are, you can begin to influence the community that you come from and go on to one day influence the larger domain under which you work. You can be from a particular colony in a particular city. Your colony should be better off because you live there. And tomorrow you can be in a big domain. That entire domain should be better off because you are in that domain. Only last year, as a graduation speaker for Dexterity School of Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Dex School, uh, an incredible institution that Dexterity has been able to build, Bharat Ratna CNR Rao sent a graduation message for our kids. And he wrote something beautiful that reflected Dexterity's founding thought. He said, I want each one of you to become famous, but I want you to become famous by making your field famous. Whichever field you are in, it can be nanotechnology, it can be microeconomics, it can be microcredit, microfinance. That field should become famous because you are in that. So that is something that I just add to that. But largely, here's what I have to say to you. As young Indians who have the gift of the internet, 
for whom resources have been democratized. You do not have to, you know, build a website from scratch. There are drag and drop websites. You don't have to build an email server for your company. You can buy that off Google. You don't have to, you know, go to a painter or an artist or a graphic designer in order to get your company's creatives made. You can do that on a design software. It is important to begin to feel within because you cannot do that using AI. You cannot do that using machine learning. That feeling, you need to begin to feel. I would like to end largely giving you a patriotism test because you see television channels want to test your patriotism and radio shows want to tell you who a patriot is. Swami Vivekanand at one point writes beautifully. He says that I too have my definition for patriotism. And I have never come across a better definition and I want to leave you with that because it is less of a definition and it is more of a test. He says, it's a threefold definition. The first part he says, that when you see that this great, in this great nation there are people who cannot eat well, who cannot sleep well, who do not have schools, who do not have prosperity, who cannot fetch for themselves, does that pain you? Does that bother you? Do you feel? That's the first question Swamiji asks. Swami Vivekananda, in his definition of patriotism, the first part he says is, do you feel? That is the first part. Do you feel the pain of others? Does it bother you when, you, when a girl child is out of school? When an elderly person cannot get health care? When somebody in this country is in pain, is, does that become your pain as well? The second part that he says is brilliant. Where he says, it is not enough to just feel the pain. Have you come up with a plan of work that can alleviate that pain. Have you said two words of consolation to the person who is in pain? That's the second part that Swamiji talks about. Then he says the third thing, where he says that patriotism is not just feeling alone. It is not just saying two words of consolation alone or coming up with a plan of work. It is to continue to walk the path of that plan of work, even if the whole world is opposed to you, even if the task looks Himalayan, and even if people come out with swords to attack you, would you still walk that path? If you are willing to do that, then you are a true patriot. As students, as a generation of young citizens, as one of the greatest generations this country might have seen, just by the fact that you live in a free world that is just connected to every single part of the world, every single domain, everything, I invite you to feel that definition of patriotism. Because that, the moment you begin doing that, it will bridge the gap between your education and leadership. Your education will begin to flip a classroom for a girl child somewhere in an island district of Majuli in, Brahmapu in Brahmaputra in the state of Assam. That will begin to make you feel that your education, can it change healthcare? Can it empower our farmers? Can it make our education better? Can it make shopping experiences and eating experiences, whatever it is, where will your education come and play a transformative impact? That is important. So I just repeat that part of patriotism. Do you feel that in this great nation, if somebody is in pain, if somebody is out of school, somebody is out of hospital, it is your responsibility. Have you come up with a plan of work and are you willing to walk that path? And I end again with a Swamiji quote where he says, I hold every person a traitor who, after having been educated at the cost of others, thinks not even a bit about them. So remember, everybody who's in attendance and everybody who's listening, you can be considered a traitor if your education is not of use. 12 years ago, we started inspiring young people training young people and nurturing young people to put their education to use so that it is not a generation of traitors, it is a generation of leaders. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your uplifting words. Now I would like to call upon Khushbu and Parth, who are the interviews for today to begin with the interview. Thank you so much, sir. That was really informative and inspiring. Sir, you talked about all the opportunities you have created so far through Dexterity Global. I wanted to ask you that it has been more than a year since you have struck with this pandemic. So uh, how exactly did a company like Dexterity Global, which caters to the needs of millions of people, adapt to this new scenario? See, we did not just adapt to the new scenario. We also impacted the pandemic a little bit. Uh, that is that uh, we continued, of course, everything that was happening at Dexterity, uh, it used, thankfully, 
Thankfully, India has been more connected through mobile phones in the last five, six years. And uh, because of that reason, Dex Connect, it reaches mobile phones, it reaches classrooms through school principals and teachers. So those things were not impacted. There was one uh, over the summer, we bring our kids in residence uh, that was impacted. So that we ran it digitally. Uh, this year, we'll be hopefully bringing them in residence. Hopefully, all will get vaccinated before that. So those things we continue to do. Everything that was running was continued to run. But we felt it was our responsibility to do something during the time of the pandemic. And what we did was, of course, uh, most of the money that the organization had set, had set aside for the residential program, we donated it to in the slums of organizations working in the slums of Dharavi. We donated it to uh, residential school for most marginalized girls here in Bihar uh, and to several organizations that were doing good work. And so that was one part. I never considered the financial part a part at all. Uh, the other two things we did during the pandemic, which are noteworthy. One, through our own Seva training program, we sent our kids Corona Warrior Seva training kits, where we explained the science behind the pandemic. We explained to them what their family should be doing so that they could be, you know, that the, continue to be those local role models within the family. The most interesting thing that Dexterity did was, which I think was unprecedented, it was only after that that now Nestle and others have come up uh, with something like this. That was that... I like to speak with our young people again and again, like I'm continuously uh, in uh, conversations. Around March, when I started speaking with our young people, I saw that many of them, they had lost their internships, their job offers had been resigned, and uh, young people were wondering uh, what would they do with a break on their CV, that gap on their resume. And uh, within three days time, on the 17th of April, we decided this, on the 20th of April, uh, we launched the 1000 internships program, uh, which was a young professional development program that Dexterity built within three days' time. We opened the applications for it. Within 10 days' time, on uh, May the 1st, we had announced the 1,000 people who we had picked. They came from 27 states and 310 districts of India, from Wokha and Nagaland to Kandor and Kerala. And uh, except for Goa, every single state was represented. And uh, we did not just offer them one month and two month internships in management, design, research, and communication, but also gave them a career readiness and training program, after which many of them actually went on to work at Fortune 500 companies, and some, due to our bad influence, started their own companies. That was our role during the pandemic. That is really commendable, sir. And uh, I heard about all the new innovation that you did. But I think more than the innovation, what matters is the belief and grit of a person to continue the good work. And that is clearly visible in the case of Dexterity Global. So, uh, sir, this is a question which has been at the back of my mind ever since I read about you. Uh, you graduated from Tufts University with a degree in international relations. Uh, you also had an offer from Harvard University for completing your master's. What was it that made you decide to come back to work in India rather than study at Harvard? So I, the day I had left for college, I knew that the night of my graduation, I would return to India. That was something that I knew from day one, because, uh, you know, everybody used to tell me when I was younger, they used to tell me you can't go to the US. Uh, then they used to tell me you can't study on a full scholarship. Then they used to tell me after I got selected, got selected on a full scholarship that you'll never come back. So I used to tell them, see, I have had this clarity. I'll go on day one and I'll come back on the night of my graduation. And it is true on the night of my graduation, I was the graduation speaker, the first in 160 years of university history, first Indian uh, to be the graduation speaker. I spoke and at the night, everybody was partying. I took my flight and I returned and I came back to Patna. I came back to Bihar. The question is about Harvard. So in Boston, Harvard, MIT, Tufts, these are all five minutes away. They are all great institutions and, you know, all four years, we all spend time together with like professors and resources, libraries, everything you largely continue to share. And for me, it would have been my super senior year in Boston. I was very young uh, and it was, uh, you know, it would have been my fifth year in Boston. It would just have been a continuation. And in masters, many times in the American setting, of course, uh, the average age of the incoming class is usually higher. Uh, they come in even when you know they are between 25 and 30. It is not so much between 20 and 25. So I felt that, you know, I could go back, work, continue to work. And when I feel like that I have to come back, I will come back and I'll take my degree. It has been five years. People have been pushing me and asking me and trying to send me. I am still seeing what I want to do. 
like what i want to do in terms of whether i want to go back and get the degree or not right so all right uh, so so in your initial speech uh, that was really good you took us through the line of examples real examples or you and you also mentioned some uh, sayings of swami vivekananda so like on this occasion i would also like to quote one of his sayings that my countrymen should have nerves of steel muscles of iron and minds like thunderbolt right so do you think that our countrymen our human community are we moving in that right direction you are making all your efforts do you think that the human community all of us are moving in that direction see all of us in one day at one moment will not move in that direction there will of, of course be some challenges here and there and i think of course we have our fair share of challenges but quality people should not be accidents quality people should be results of our system the problem is we can accept it that except for maybe few institutions in our country schools and colleges included quality individuals are who who contribute actively are accidents of the system they are not intended results of the system so we do need to see what the goal of our school education is what the goal of our college education is where it should be clear in the mind of the educator the mind of the trainer that our intended result is a nation builder the thing is result is not even focused at in at many schools it is a swimming pool it is the you know horse riding uh, area it is the smart classes that are sold what is not sold is the vision so the vision should be very clear it only in that case uh, you know uh, we'd be able to build an army of people like that in different fields so that is the reason why i feel it is a slow process but remember one good influence and chances are that within our lifetime and uh, especially with the work uh, dexterity is doing and i hope other organizations must be doing uh, and uh, shall do in the future uh, even if we have a few thousand people they'll have tremendous influence on the country right sir very well said and i hope that uh, all the young generations basically try to understand the link between education and how they can effectively implement that education for their future and for the country uh thank you so much sir i am pretty sure it is because of ideologies like these that you have been honored by numerous national as well as international organization uh you also had the distinct honor of being invited to the white house by mr obama now uh he is someone who has always inspired many of us so can you enlighten us about that experience and uh, how it felt being recognized worldwide for your efforts uh it it was a great experience of course president obama has been one of my heroes um i was uh, the year i started dexterity that is the year he became the president and uh, president obama is you know like that hero in a movie why do we like movies because it is on a movie screen where the hero convincingly beats the villain uh why do we not like real world many times because the hero many times convincingly gets beaten up by the villain so uh, you see a harvard educated smart intellectual ethical person in the field of politics and he gets elected the president and he beats history he beats his opponent he beats everyone and everything to be that you know the first non white president in over 200 years of american history so he was definitely an inspiration that good guys can win that good people can you know get the job done because you are told that oh politics is only for the crooked it is only for the unethical that might also be partially true but he made it you know uh, very very different so he was definitely a hero in 2016 he was leaving office and he decided to invite 200 young leaders who will have an influence on this century to the white house on october 3 2016 and uh, i spent 9 hours at the white house before that and after corona i don't remember when was the last time i spent 9 hours at my own house but i spent 9 hours at white house um i spent 90 minutes with the president and uh, besides that we met people like leonardo dicaprio uh, who was working on climate change at that point in time we met john lewis who recently passed away the only surviving leader of the civil rights movement and we met some exceptional people and uh, then 90 minutes president briefed us he asked us how we were doing uh, he asked me if i was having a good time and stuff as like that so it was a very good uh, exchange and uh, he told us basically you know the challenges for the future and what we should be working on how we should be approaching things like well, one of the things i'll never forget is that he said that many times young people get frustrated because they sit with a calendar for change that okay monday i start something friday change needs to come 
He said that there's no calendar for change. Change is incremental. Uh, this will also, you know, partially answer the question that your good friend asks, asked a few minutes back, if all of us are moving in the right direction. So no, it is an incremental process. So he said change is always incremental. Change does not follow a calendar. And then he said something that uh, we see somebody who's not driving an electric car and we are like, oh, that person is a climate change denier. Many times you need to know that person is just poor. That person cannot afford your innovations. So that is something that he said that you need to keep in mind. Don't make enemies. Understand why that person does not buy into your idea. Are you making your idea affordable or accessible for that person? So these were very smart, I think, very insightful points that after becoming, you know, the president of the United States, arguably the most powerful person in the world, if you can still be so grounded, so such penetrating thought where you have such sharp understanding, it is just brilliant. And uh, of course, his humility, him being on time, him being punctual, all those things, of course, were also very, very inspiring. It was the day of his marriage anniversary. He was with us till 8.30 or uh, something. And then he had to uh, go for get dinner with Michelle. So he, you know, excused himself and then he left. But you see, uh, it, it's just great that you can be the president of the United States. You have to be disciplined. You have to be punctual. Uh, you have to, you know, follow the clock. You are the servant of the clock, not the clock, your servant. So these things are all very, very great. Uh, so that was October of 2016. It was great. Absolutely, sir. Uh, I think I want to request all the audience to take note of all the uh, wisdom, uh, words of wisdom that sir is imparting because you don't get to hear them live. Okay, sir, from whatever I could gather, you are uh, very fond of traveling and talking to young people. So that is the I kind of question. No, you only mentioned that and I also could frame out from whatever you are saying. Yeah. So there's a similar type of question in the audience as well. Like uh, you talk to students from different parts of the world. So do you think that there is a difference in the mindset of uh, millennials in India and other parts of the world? If we talk about entrepreneurial mindset or leadership mindset, any significant difference that you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you see it. Uh, it is uh, very, it's not an easy question. You know, it is not the horsepower of one car and the other. It is not the mileage of one car and the other. Uh, these are all people, they're all unique. Some will start a company at the age of 13 and somebody will start a company at the age of 76. You, and one company can be KFC and the other company will come in Dhanik Bhaskar one time and never again. Okay, so you see it does not matter. And I am nobody to make that sweeping remark. I think uh, what my travels have told me is that Indian kids, they still come raised by a generation of parents who struggled in their lives, who worked very hard to put their kids through school or college, who took out a loan to send their kids to college many times. So many children who are connected with that struggle or the story of their parents, they are very driven, they are very motivated. And of course, uh, there is something great about our country that uh, largely uh, we are not yet very self-centered. Slowly we are being advocated that you be happy, you don't care about the world. But uh, we are still not very self-centered. So we want to do something. I go uh, to very quality institutions and then people are like, we, we also want to do something like you. How do like, like we want to leave our like not get a job do this do that i'm like no wherever you go there you can make change you don't have to leave everything in order to make change happen so overall i think um, it's an impressive uh, generation that hopefully will stay rooted to purpose and uh, to goals and about my travel i have never bought a flight ticket in my life uh, i have traveled and i have traveled and i have traveled and i have traveled but I have never bought a ticket. I have never gone to a place till I was invited. So, but yes, I have traveled a lot. In 2019, I think I delivered 258 speeches across 24 states. So that's a lot. But yeah, so that kind of traveling has happened, but I only God knows how. Wonderful, sir. That was really great to know. And we are really delighted that you could take out some time and come here when you travel a uh, lot. So uh, when we listen to your name, so there is a designation social entrepreneurship uh, that's uh, written. And uh, from the audience as well, I 
I think there must be many people who are starting, uh, who are thinking to start their own ventures or are budding entrepreneurs. So, if you have to give one sort of advice to them, what would that be? Don't fall into the trap of entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship. Stay focused on creating value. If you create value, you'll not die a pauper. Uh, Bill Gates and Paul Allen were walking down a shopping mall and they saw a computer on the front page of a magazine. And they said the people who will run this computer in the future, they will be on the front page of the magazine. And they built softwares. Their idea was that software would run the world. It became true. Software runs the world, including the one through which we are talking and including the one through which you are listening. And uh, they became billionaires. Steve Jobs, when he died, Bill Gates said that the world is a richer place today because Steve Jobs did not choose to be the richest man at his burial. Again, very clear, Steve Jobs had an idea that devices need to be beautiful. They should be like bicycle for the mind and it should be seamless. And he built a company and it became a billion dollar company. So none of the billionaires started out to become billionaires. They solved a problem and they ended up solving a problem for a large number of people that it became, you know, that they became billionaires. Like clearly, if you solve a problem for 10 people, they'll take you out for a movie. If you solve a problem for 1 billion people, they'll give you probably enough money to, you know, make movies of your own, uh, even when nobody watches it. So the thing is that uh, overall, you have to identify where will you create value. And uh, I often talk about Bill Gates 1.0 and Bill Gates 2.0. Many people see Bill Gates 2.0 as the man who changed the world through Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation by making donations, by making strategic philanthropy something uh, this great. But you look at Bill Gates 1.0, by building Microsoft, he changed the world. He increased human productivity tremendously. You started using Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, Word. It just changed the way humans worked. Human productivity went up. Global economy expanded by trillions of dollars. That changed the world as well. So you have to know, like uh, somebody said at one point that uh, uh, Steve Jobs saved more trees by building the iPad than, you know, somebody just going and hugging a tree and asking you not to cut it. So you see, wherever you are, you can create tremendous impact. Sometimes uh, the direct intended impact is in the field of education, healthcare, agriculture, then they call it social entrepreneurship. But uh, in general, I consider all of this entrepreneurship. I have probably never uh, written my designation as a social entrepreneur. I myself don't know who I am, whether I'm a teacher, educator, leader, speaker, orator, all, I don't know. I get called all kinds of things, including uh, something that Divya Bhaskar once said, which I do not want to repeat. But uh, overall, uh, entrepreneur in, in general, uh, your goal has to be problem solving and leadership. You solve a problem, and as a leader in that industry, in that domain, you, you know, build out that solution for many, many people. So that's something that you can, you know, do. And then let people call you an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur. When I started out, I didn't probably even know the spelling of social entrepreneur or entrepreneur for that matter. I didn't know that this was entrepreneurship. I only knew this was required. And then everything happened. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, that was indeed very enlightening. And I'm sure that the young entrepreneurs in our audience will take note of that. And uh, this is for our audience. If uh, many of you don't know, uh, Divya Bhaskar called for the Swami Vivekananda of modern India. So uh, yeah, that's just something that you should all know. Yeah. And uh, that's embarrassing. Sir, <laughs> <laughs> sir we have so another question for you. Yeah, please ask. Uh, we have another yeah, question for you from the audience. Indeed, that was enlightening. So, I think that I end the direct question. I'm like, 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 uh, should we accept, expect some new schemes in India or will you be focusing more on expanding abroad? Uh, we will continue. Our goal is to build local role models in 700 plus districts of India. We see our work as generational work. Uh, it will take generation after generation. I am not here to you know uh, score one big point here or one big point there. This is generational work. We shall continue to do the same. 
new things that we need in order to build you know next generation leaders in terms of talent development in terms of talent identification in terms of you know just grooming and nurturing future leaders we will continue to you know introduce those platforms but our focus shall continue to be india at one point i do uh, accept between 2008 and 2012 we had thought of expanding the same services to people in west africa in latin america but the more we continue to work in india we realized that it is probably better to go deeper than wider so we'll go deeper in india as opposed to wider in the world i am not seeking any fame or glory none of the people in the organization are seeking any of that we are seeking generational change we are see- and we are seeing it as generational work so we shall continue to do this and every dexter will continue to you know influence different fields in their own ways so uh, that will continue to happen thank you so much sir for your candor and for enlightening us with the various aspects of your journey uh, we are almost end, uh, nearing the end of this conclave uh, our audience has been with us from yesterday and still i can see in the chat box that the josh is high so uh, they were all extremely excited to listen to you uh, we all learned something new and would go back with a new and rejuvenated approach to life so we wish you all the best for all your future endeavors and uh, hope you keep reaching great heights and inspiring us Uh, once again thank you for gracing phenomena with your presence thank you so thank much thank you very sir. much to thank you very much to each member of the organizing team in your work matters and it has created an impact i hope you know that this evening once you are done with this and i thank every single person who tuned in to watch digital speeches are tough to watch but that you did I appreciate that very much thank you very much for having me take care and i wish and pray for the very best for each one of you Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. That was indeed a very inspiring session. Now we are nearing an end to our conclave, but before that, I would just uh, like to give a note of thanks. I would like to thank all the viewers for attending the event and enhancing the sheen of this conclave, which was prime motive for all of us. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Manoj Sinha, our principal of Aryabhat College, University of Delhi. for gracing the event with his presence i would also like to thank our convener dr j k singh and our coordinator dr prithika dua for the continuous guidance and never ending motivation i would also like to thank uh, ms priya choudhury and mr sanket shekhar for addressing the key moments of our conclave this all could not have been possible without the guidance of all of you the sole be- uh, motive behind this conclave was to provide insights and knowledge about different industries to all our viewers and that too when we were all sitting at home without having the privilege of physical interaction but team fic took the initiative to uh, make these adept personalities reach to all of you virtually hope you were able to accomplish a motive we thank all our respected speakers who graced this event with their presence and gave the students amazing opportunities to learn and prosper through their words I being the general secretary of this prestigious team feel immensely proud that this conclave is now a big success. This could not have been possible without the dedication of a whole team, be it organizing the front end work or the back end. Team FIC proved it yet again that yes, we are one of the most respected societies in the entire Delhi University and that is for a reason. Thank you so much team. Thank you so much faculty members for making this conclave a huge success. Thank you so much everyone. Ha- have a great evening ahead. But before that I would like to call our respected principal sir professor um, Manoj Sinha to address the gathering and give a note of thanks. I think Anisha sir hasn't joined. He'll be joining in a minute. um so now um ma'am can i call by that time uh, you call sarthak and karsh ma'am actually they are not here right now okay so, so then um, uh, if jk sir is comfortable he can address by that time hello ha uh, am i audible yes sir okay thank you anisha and the entire team of fic for hosting and organizing such a wonderful event which ran for two days consecutively for two days and a lot of experts from diverse areas 
they uh, attended and shared their experience their valuable experience with our students and viewers and uh, i came to know that it was attended by a large number of people uh, through youtube access besides uh, google meet and in fact uh, anisha was kind enough to praise the faculty members but let me uh, very honestly admit that since students are the important portion of the stakeholders of the entire academic institution and uh, they have delivered the job in such a wonderful manner that i really appreciate and applaud their efforts uh, principal sir has also joined just now so he was kind enough and his role is uh, i mean i have no words to explain that how uh, he has always been very inspiring and encouraging to us through his all messages and through uh, his words and uh, it is all through culmination of the efforts of all of us that we have brought this success to the event and hopefully such events would be conducted in future also and i am thankful to pritika who uh, as principal has already said that he was leading she was leading from the front and she has really she deserved to be appreciated and uh, the entire team my colleague uh, sanket uh, whom i asked today that he should also welcome uh, mr uh, arvind mayaram and he he gave his consent immediately and priya and all the faculty members who have been associated with us for in this uh, society but uh, in fact the show is totally uh, gone to the court of students and uh, they have really conducted it very well and i wish it should have been conducted through offline mode then it would have brought more cheer to us and hopefully when we'll have a normal situation after covid will definitely look forward for such kind of participation again so with these words i congratulate the entire team of students of our fic and uh, they have really done a very commendable job and i'll definitely give a very good feedback to the principal for all what you have done and you deserve all kind of appreciation so best of luck please continue to perform in future also and hopefully such events would be conducted Uh, in future also so a uh, principal has joined and he has been waiting and uh, so i would request anisha to kindly invite him thanks a lot thanks a lot thank you so much jk sir uh, your words really mean a lot to us now i would like to cordially invite up um, principal sir professor manoj sinha to kindly address the gathering thank you anisha uh, much uh, grateful to the fic for having uh, once again invited me to the valedictory uh, i had the choice of being with you throughout the two days of program and uh, uh, from whatever i have seen you know whenever i have joined in and uh, uh, watched the various talks your participation and everything i'm really impressed i mean i'm uh, extremely extremely happy with uh, the way the two day conclave was uh, conducted uh, the kind of uh, inputs you got from people the kind of participation you all showed it uh, shows a bit of a coming of age of our uh, fic uh, team and uh, you know of institution as a whole uh, there is a it seems there is a lot more clarity in our faculty members also and you as organizers all the student uh, leaders among you and uh, also our uh, good participation from our uh, other students who have all participated in today affair and so all in all just saying that extremely happy with whatever you have done from my side there is a, a clap for all of you uh as i watched the two days and from whatever reports i got wherever i was not there uh, you know uh, inaugural i was there myself and melakshi lekhi ji was uh, talking to you and she talked about the government whatever it has done you know all the necessary uh, 
commodities it has provided services it has provided during covid times etc i mean that's the part she was emphasizing on but she also told you how difficult it is to be a political person hmm? look so glamorous to be a political person from outside isn't it ha huh? she has uh, brought you the realities of being a political person you know it's not easy being a leader is not something i mean you know reaching a leadership level is one thing and to keep up with the whole uh, you know responsibility of being a leader is quite another it also holds true of bureaucrats and later on uh, uh, you know um, uh, somebody talked about it uh, you know the administrator today arvind mayaram isn't it he was talking about it isn't it uh, <clears throat> why and how you should become an is i mean or, or a bureaucrat hmm? arvind mayaram did talk to you about it that you know what should be your focus and uh, uh, he's given you a lot of insights uh, from his own experiences in uh, in the civil services okay as an administrator but uh, generally i mean you know when you get into a responsible position of a being a civil servant to a political leader you got all the inputs from uh, either from uh, minachi lekhi or arvind mayaram etc but you also got certain inputs from uh, frederico salas uh, the ambassador of mexico isn't it he talked about uh, our relationship uh, and the developed countries uh, uh, how they should focus on climate change etc etc but there is a certain point of view that developing countries also take you know for example i could talk about malaysia separately malaysia feels that you know these developed countries they have a point of view because they have utilized all the essential inputs ingredients and malaysia depends a lot on their forest uh, outputs that means you know it has to cut trees to sustain its own economy etc so now you uh, us or somebody will give lamba lectures on uh, there should be no tree cutting etc etc but uh, they have a different point of view but anyway we could elaborate it we'll debate it some other day you are already tired in two days of uh, talks etc so i'll not take you there but there are different views on the environment and sustainability question also uh, uh ashok vajpayee ji also talk a lot about lit- literature language and uh, also spirituality coming from different religion etc and uh, sharad vivek sagar also has encouraged to take up leadership roles now uh, leadership is something that uh, comes into focus a lot because every organization you go into as students you know needs a certain leadership role and the development of that uh, Uh, or management of the leadership qualities inside you will be key to how high you can go in leadership positions that means you know getting into a, 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 a certain company or a certain corporate life or any government that's one part of it the growth inside any company or any any organization that you work in uh, depends a lot on the leadership qualities that you are going to develop or you are going to have so my advice to all of you is that during these 3 years you should focus on developing those skills inside you so that you can you know get those leadership qualities inside you sunny garg also shared about his uh, life and journey uh, being an entrepreneur huh? so many of you are going into private businesses or in corporate life so there's a lot to learn from uh, him also hmm? metali uh, ji talked about uh, how covid has impacted the economy and also stock market growth is not being related to the economic growth of the country which we can all see i mean every for everybody there is this uh, uh, ex- near explosion in the share market isn't it it's surprisingly gone to 50000 everybody thought that it will go to the dumps because you know covid has impacted the economy etc etc it is uh, behaved completely in the reverse a uh, stock market which is the amazing thing but that's how life is that's how uh, you know the everybody is looking at the positive side and looking at the growth potential in the economy and uh, it's expected uh, until the population is there we all down uh, die in major majority because of covid we are going or all going to uh, consume and once we consume we need some production and production is going to give rise to uh, you know more and more growth in economy and therefore the consumption story is still there and therefore the growth in uh, share market but good i mean i i am glad that all of you have 
got some hang of all these things. Okay, Arvind Mayaram, of course, we discussed, and Hari Shaya, he talked about his uh, child abuse th uh, stories, and also companies giving employment to uh, everyone, all people, including the general uh, gender neutral people and everybody, and. Uh, the whole message is that everybody should be treated like equal human beings everywhere we are. You know, there are problems in treating people equally. It's not a question of something that you do out of fashion. You know, uh, I'm being taught or told to treat uh, women with some, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, kid glove or being taught not to differentiate between blacks and whites or you know south indians and north indians or you know things like that or caste divide that we have so much in india all the kinds of or people from other states there are times in delhi when we don't treat northeastern people right the key to everything is and i'm just adding on to what you have already learned and that is Key to everything is treat everybody like you would like to be treated when you go anywhere. I mean, I've been to Amer uh, England, I've been to America. I mean, uh, there are countries I have been to. I don't feel unconfident. I mean, I'm not a white. I'm a quite uh, brown person. <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you, uh, you know, see the categorization that the Western world sees over there, yellow and brown and black and everything. But I've never felt, uh, I mean, I've been confident enough to treat myself as a co-equal to any other white that has been there, a European or Caucasian mm -hmm. in America or anybody. And that's how I treat anybody else also. I mean, the best way of seeing a person, I mean, treat, uh, you know, evaluating a person is what? Uh, <clears throat> as a person, you meet somebody and you have to evaluate, look, look at if it's a boy, go to his shoes. And look at shoes, how he treats people there. The best way of evaluating him is that. Sabne wo dekha hai na, kaun sa, kis mein wo advice deta hai, three years mein. Koi ek movie hai, jis mein, ha ha, Munna Bhai, Munna Bhai gives that, Munna Bhai gives that girl an advice, ki us ladke se milne ja rahi hai, abhi she doesn't know ki shadi karni hai, nahi karni hai, to ho kehta hai ki jau uske saath restaurant mein baitho, aur dekho ki wo waiter ko kaise call karta hai. And then how he treats the waiter is the character that person is. Okay, so our characters are reflected in how we treat other people, however low, high or anything. And that is how, that is what defines us as persons, you know. So, हमारे अपने बिहेवियर में वो सब रिफ्लेक्ट करना चाहिए यू नो द काइंड ऑफ ट्रीटमेंट वी वांट फ्रॉम अदर्स शुड बी डन टू अदर्स आल्सो डू वन टू अदर्स हाउ यू वुड डू वन हाउ यू वुड हैव देम डू वन टू यू दैट्स अ की मैसेज ओवर देयर सो विदाउट बोरिंग यू टू मच एंड वंस अगेन कांग्रेचुलेटिंग ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर हैविंग डन सच वंडरफुल जॉब ओवर दिस टू डेज लेट मी से टू all my faculty members led by jk singh uh, the person who is proving to be a pillar of growth in the journey of aryabhat college aryabhat college being such a young college is dependent on hard work of all of you and we know all this so my congratulations to all the students and especially the students i mean all of you are so energetic full of energy in doing everything that you want to do uh, in life and it is getting reflected in the activities of the college and I'm extremely, extremely glad about it. Uh, thank you faculty members for leading them so well and uh, JK Singh Ji for leading our faculty members uh, through this journey. Uh, all the best, wish you well and uh, uh, enjoy your uh, rest after these two days of hard work. Okay, all the best. Bye-bye. Huh? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in fact, I was supposed to speak after uh, your address, but I started since uh, you were about to join. So, but thanks for your very supportive and encouraging words, and your mere presence gives us enough ammunition to take up such challenges. And in future, also, I expect that you would be showering sign, uh, same kind of blessing on us and on our students. So, thanks for being with us for two days and uh, uh, this event was a great success let me inform you 
uh, that uh, around uh, more than 2000 people attended the event and the entire uh, credit of this program goes to our student uh, members uh, who have been uh, continuously remain glued to the mobiles and their Uh, they conceived all these thing well at uh, 10 days back almost 15 days back and then uh, they uh, developed all kind of strategies to bring this success to the college so i am thankful to the entire team and now i would request uh, anisha to please follow up on madam pritika before pritika or anisha come let me put a demand to you i'm sorry i'm intervening but i want a report uh, session yeah. wise also and an overall report and photographs of each session also and uh, uh, overall uh, you know whatever photographs you want there for the records and for our website okay that should be yeah. done pritika please take responsibility for this yes sir we are already goes to her. Okay. we are we are already working on it sir thank you so much okay thank you so much sir um now i would like to call upon uh, pritika dua ma'am our coordinator she has been a constant support and uh, her guidance has helped us um, make this event a success so ma'am can you please uh, address the audience good evening everyone on behalf of the entire fraternity of aryabhat college my heartfelt thanks to all the dignitaries teachers students who have actively participated in the success of this event i must mention a deep sense of appreciation for all the speakers for gracing this occasion a special mention to our respectable principal sir professor manoj sinha who undoubtedly inspired and motivated us at each step moreover i don't think the words would be sufficient enough for the feeling of gratitude i have for dr jk singh who has been a constant support and guide i would also like to show my gratitude to my colleagues ms priya choudhury and mr sanket shekhar who have helped in co organizing the event last but not the least most important my students my team you have worked very hard i am really really thankful to you people you have brought accolades to the college and we hope to come back with a more grander and a more successful event next year thank you so much thank you thank you so much ma'am so as we come to the end of the session all the blessings all the learnings that we have gathered in this two day conclave i would just say that this event totally served its purpose and as our teachers also mentioned that we hope to organize a bigger and a better event next year so i hope the audience will join us then till then stay happy and stay blessed thank you so much <laughs>